I'm actually drinking alcohol, an alcoholic beverage. Oh, wow. That's the spirit. Well, hello, strangers, and welcome to Drinker's Open Bar number two. It's the it's the second episode of this fantastic voyage that we're going on through the world of pop culture. Um, I, I'm trying to make a, a rule that I do this every two weeks. So one week I'll do a happy hour, another week I'll do a, an open bar and just get as many people in as possible. And damn, man, we've got some great people in tonight. We've got Mr. Longman himself, Muller. We've got Robert Hello. Meyer Burnett. We've got uh, Az from Heel vs. Babyface. Hello, yep. sir. And we've got uh, Nerdrotic is on his way, and so is Count Dankula. So they will join us when they're available. But I think for now, the four of us should be able to keep you entertained, hopefully. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me tonight. I'll raise a glass to you. Cheers to you, sir. Cheers. I feel cheers. And I'll raise a glass to everyone in chat out. as well. So, Feeling as if I'm letting a side down with this, you know. Oh, come on, has just pretend that this is a war zone stream and like just down a bottle of rum in like <laughs> ten minutes. Come on, oh, it's full right. of vodka. <laughs> you're just no, you're just playing. It's yeah. clearly vodka. Yeah, we can tell. I can, I can it's tell. a little Belvedere for you. Hold on. Oh, wait, he's going for something. Shit. Uh -oh. <laughs> hey, that's, oh, there we that's, go. That's the spirit, old boy. Ah, there we go. I was about that. <laughs> the drinker is not liable for any injuries sustained in the course of this live stream. <laughs> <laughs> God, you made, you made me just want to do a drunk war stream. Uh, war, war, hey, war stri I've one sip and I've gone back. A war stream. <laughs> so I was just back. I was like, just wanting to do a drunk uh, war zone stream again. We, we will do another one. God damn it, man. We need to do uh, another war zone. Um, and just get messed up. So, uh, <laughs> I got a little bit too messed up. One of them, <laughs> you did, yeah. Um, holy <laughs> shit, man. Once the words stopped coming out in the right order, I knew we were in trouble. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I needed to catch up, and uh, I tried, I, I sort of tried a little too hard and did very well indeed. You did, uh, yeah, in, in catching up, just like destroying a bottle of rum and. 30 minutes was it oh it was it was pretty impressive one way or the other i just remember <laughs> you at one point just going the bottle's empty <laughs> that's like it was, William, it was William Hurt that in that altered time. states taking his peyote and, and uh, reverting back to his his uh first truth state it was yeah. it was sad it was it was it was sad you know that that bottle was meant to last me the stream it it didn't make it it's, it's always, I'm it's proud always of the you. pitfall of playing yeah. catch up, isn't it? You end up it's going the intention way beyond. That matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, the intent was to get wanked, and that's what happened. Well, you you achieved that for sure, man. <laughs> yeah. So hail to chat and, and everyone who's joined us. Hopefully, we'll give you a good show this evening. Um, I mean, damn, man, it's been quite an interesting week or so in in the world of entertainment. I mean, Jesus. We've got the Matrix 4 trailer that's dropped. We've got Picard Season 2 on the way. Like, I'm sure there's at least three people in the world that are excited about that. Uh, Rob, are you are you excited? I'm actually trying to think of you know, three I, people I, that would be. Uh, I, yeah. I, I honestly have to say, you know, I've been highly critical of, of Star Trek since 2009. I call it the ongoing hostage crisis. Um, <laughs> I, I just I, won't give them back. I, I think that the... the, the the trailer for Picard season two uh, was one of the most creatively bankrupt things I've ever seen. There, there's not one shred of originality in it, all the way to the point where they have a, oh, I, I don't know how to drive a car joke that was fresh in a piece of the action, the Star Trek episode from 1967. Yeah. And now we're seeing it again. And I had read, I read that Terry Metalis, who I had high hopes for to come on to run the show, um, he says, let's do Star Trek for the voyage home again. And, and therein lies my entire problem with modern Star Trek. Let's do Star Trek for again. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why not blaze new trails? I mean, one of the things that I have always appreciated both about you and Mahler is you are story purists. And, and when both of you on your streams are talking about a fealty to classical storytelling that I do not understand why we have lost that. I mean, actually I do. I like to say on my own streams that 
you cannot put your universe, your agenda, whatever, before your characters and your story. And I look at, at that Star Trek Picard trailer and I say to myself, I can see 10 different episodes of Star Trek all mashed into one. I mean, we're, first of all, all good things again, a fascistic mm. future storyline we have to prevent, the Borg Queen back in time to the modern day where we can save on our budget. And I, I just look at this and I think, this is Star Trek. You know, you have the entire rich history, 55 years of a franchise, and you can blaze new ground, trailblaze, and, and talk about things. Star Trek was always, re the best of Star Trek was always relating back to our world today. And now all Star Trek does is relate back to other episodes of Star Trek from the past. It has yeah. nothing to really say about us now. It's so far up its own ass that all it ever does is repeat its own tropes. And it's a, well, that's a really odd way to be. When I um, when I talked about Picard and, and Discovery, like and, and basically all of Star Trek under Kurtzman and and J.J. Abrams, I was trying to make the point that like Star Trek used to represent what we could be. It was what mm. we aspired to. It was a mm. better version of ourselves where we'd we'd progress beyond all the bullshit struggles and and um, you know pettiness of life here on Earth, and we turned our our sights on a higher goal. And that was great. It was aspirational and it was inspirational. It was who we could be. But what it represents now is who we are now. We're divided. We're, we're petty. We're bitter. We're angry. We're nihilistic. That's th Those are all the things that we have in our modern culture. And they're not good things. Like Star Trek no longer represents the best in us. It represents the worst in us. And that's, <laughs> that's the real tragedy of what they've done with this show. And that used to be the alien civilizations that we discovered you know it was it was we we were sorted out and yet we would go out into the cosmos and the allegory would come and we'd find uh civilizations that were fighting wars with computers and they would all go into disintegration booths because they didn't want to deal with the messiness of war and that was something that was always interesting but now all of our characters like you just said are, are the main characters are reflections of us and where's the science fiction Where's the interesting extrapolation? I mean, you know, I think about movies, the, the way they've dealt with AI in both Picard and uh, Discovery has been at a 1970s sixth grade level. And it has been, it's so, it's so just brain dead. Mm. And I, I, I find it so frustrating to watch because it seems to me that none of the people that are reading or are, are writing Star Trek have read a science fiction novel, which has always been fairly progressive in terms of its thoughts. It's the way it's extrapolated where human society might be in a thousand years. I mean, my God, the, the Federation depicted in season three of Discovery hasn't progressed at all. <laughs> and yeah. it's just it's it makes me really want to stick my face into a plate glass window and gouge my eyes out while <laughs> <I'm there>. yeah <laughs> that's <laughs> bad times indeed yeah it's just um it, it's so disheartening to see that these these people you know have been given one of the greatest properties um in science fiction um uh, and they could do anything with it it's like the keys to the kingdom and they flushed them down the pan and that's that's ultimately what they've they've used it for um and it's 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 great for them that they were able to convey their message for like a few seasons um but no one's going to remember it long term no one's going to like look back on discovery or picard as some iconic no. sci-fi show you know people still look back on tng and say damn that was great sci-fi it was it was smart it was thought provoking it was sensitively written. It was balanced. It really, um, it really caused you to re-examine everything. Uh, nobody is going to say that about what we have now, and that's the real waste here. They can barely muster saying it now. And look at the uh, fans of TLJ and the sequel trilogy. It's like they've pretty much faded out. They're moving on to other things. That yeah. trilogy is dead. Like the, I mean, you can't use it as a foundation to promote anything. And that as well to. Uh, bolster what Robert was saying is that it's up his own ass. The sequels are constantly referencing the OT. And then if you guys remember, when TFA came out, it made a point to ignore the prequels. It was like, we're not about the prequels. You guys hated that, right? We're doing our own thing. 
by the time you get to the Lost of the sequels, they're like, prequels are pretty good, right? We got some references. Yeah. We looked up Darth, Darth Maul. We got to, like Darth Maul in Solo, right? Like, come on, please. Honestly, <laughs> like at this point, I'm like, come back, prequels, all is forgiven. <laughs> like, but the thing well, is, they, they're even pilfering the prequels. That's how, like, they just, it's, it's got to be something. They just drug up anything. They can't make their own stuff, essentially. Yeah. yeah. The thing about the prequels is, I've always said they're bad movies. But they're pretty good Star Wars in the sense that the story, it's, it's not well told, but it is relatively interesting in terms of where George Lucas was going. I mean, the death of democracy and all of those mm. kinds of things. It's mm. just not well told. Mm. And it's yeah. not yeah. well. The, the, the human element in it is so I mean, the problem with George Lucas is he, he was removed from humanity because of his own success so he forgot what people were like in the real world <laughs> I, I think with george as well like he's he's a great ideas man he's just not necessarily a great writer um or a great director and so you need other people there to, to kind of shepherd his vision along and cut out the crap and bring it to a point where it's actually something really um cinematic that works yeah. well and they he you know, by the point that he was doing the prequels, there was nobody like that around and there was no one to challenge him. He had too much power and too much control. And the result is, yeah, you get these these movies that were well-intentioned and had a great concept behind them. They were just horribly implemented because he just wasn't the guy to be in charge of that. You know, he shouldn't yet, have been doing that. Having one person solely in charge of a trilogy is still better than what they did with the sequels where it kept like hot potatoing between different people oh. and then overall approved an umbrella by Kathleen Kennedy or whoever else gave us this zombified trilogy. It's it's a must it's it's a great insight into just how conflicting artistic visions uh will wreak havoc on a franchise. Like literally just watching one guy rub you know, erase out um, the the storylines and the characters of the previous guy, and then the other guy come back and do it again to him. It, it's crazy. It's like two kids fighting over a toy. Yeah, no, you know, I've played out with hundreds of millions of dollars at stake. I've said previously, but like with the prequels, I've, if we did a rewrite, I'd be willing to tweak lots of scenes, tweak lots of dialogue, and we can get something going. But with the sequels, it's like <laughs> we're starting from the beginning. We're getting rid of all yeah. of it, all yeah. their ideas, the garbage. Well, you know, one of the things I love about your streams, Mahler, is you point out the just the illogic <laughs> of everything that is happening. <laughs> you know, just uh, you make I love your like you make these asides and and you're you're so dead on. And I really I really think that one of the great problems with everyone who's trying to do write or create science fiction on on movies and tele, movies and television movies, yeah, cinema and, and television is that. They haven't read science fiction. You know, the, science fiction is an, an inherently literary genre, and there's no underpinnings of understanding of that genre uh, by the people that are writing science fiction. And I, I'm like, look, man, if I was the showrunner of any science fiction show, I would say, look, I require of you, the writing staff, here's 20 books that were written over the course of the 20th century, I need you to read these books and just kind of have an understanding of, of world building and, and, and science fiction in general. And what is it like? What does it mean to extrapolate how the future would look based on our technology today? And simple things that I think that if you had any working knowledge of literary science fiction, you'd be a better TV and movie writer. If, if it comes to the people who are doing Discovery, can we just give them like creative writing 101? Like, that, that's <laughs> we've got to start with the basics here. <laughs> did, um, did any of you well, guys? Uh, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, but we can't because they haven't. Uh, because uh, Kurtzman himself said this has got nothing to do with Star Trek anymore. So I can't even look at these as Star Trek because they're not. Yeah. This isn't Star uh, Trek. This is this is a, a corpse, a skin. Which goes over their their messaging, uh, and if Discovery is anything to go by, then the the message that I get from Discovery is that um, segregation is the way forward. Uh, be petrified of the LGBT community because they're mental. Um, that uh, white people shouldn't be dropped from the universe uh, and not given any positions of power. It's the most intolerant thing that I've I've watched in in years. It's the most disgusting television uh, that I've I've ever seen, and, and to have the brand of Star Trek attached to it 
is is an insult beyond compare. You should be stripped of it and called it and call what it is, which is just political agenda in space. It, uh, none surreal. of the characters. Sorry, go no, on. sorry, sorry, man. On, go, on you go. No, none of the characters are uh, noteworthy. None of them are aspirational. None of them uh, show any form of leadership, uh, show any qualities, show any empathy. They have a bridge crew that I challenge people to name after three seasons gone and the fourth season just starting. There is nothing about these characters whatsoever that inspire, that, that make me want to go out into the stars, that make me want to go out into the universe, which make me think that humans can do anything like that. This is the most incompetent bunch of people I've ever seen in control of a ship. Yeah. How it even gets out of dock is a mystery to me. And then they <laughs> crashed it on a planet, but still it works. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and this is and this is our uh, main series of Star Trek. And then if you saw the casting for um Strange New Worlds, uh they're going to have to explain how Khan's granddaughter is on the ship as oh when when he hasn't uh, even been no. as so it's, terrible. It's, there's one that's, that's part of star trek you haven't raped yet is fucking khan oh they've been yeah. oh, no, no, into darkness dude come on i was gonna say well, yeah, yeah yeah well uh, yeah but as mm. joe was diverse oh well i mean it's diverse in the fact that i never want to go anywhere near any fucking of their characters you, you know, you know uh, i want to be divided from them Divided. When I, when I divided at, from them. When I look at how characters in Discovery, like senior officers amongst the, the ship's crew, act and how they worked with each other, it's like young children that have just been put in charge of a starship and they're yelling at each other, yeah. they're they're emotional, they talk about their feelings, they have a good pant wet and cry, <laughs> they hold each other, and then they move on to the next like you know disaster that they have to try and overcome. I, I always take I always refer people to this really good episode of TNG when Data is put in charge of the Enterprise and mm -hmm. Worf continually questions him. He doesn't mean to necessarily, but he expresses frustration with his style of leadership. Yep. And so Data calmly takes him into the ready room and just explains to him, You're not security officer now, you're you're the first officer, and it's up to you to implement my instructions once I've made my decisions. You know, you can present me with options, but once I've made my decision, you have to like, you have to follow me up and back me up in that. And if you can't do that, then it's time for you to quit. Uh, and it's just a really matter of fact, direct conversation between two professional men who know what they're doing, and it's so fucking well handled. It's a masterclass in how you write good characters. That like sounds that. toxic. You know, it's absolutely toxic, but Discovery would never have the, the the brains and the restraint to do a scene like that. Discovery so, doesn't understand the chain of command. No. There is no oh. chain of command in, in that there's no respect for the chain of command. You've had a second in command, which has been essentially the captain for the whole show, that has shown disdain for their captain, that has uh, uh, disobeyed their orders at every turn, that has uh, initiated their own orders and at no point has been disciplined from it a apart from in, in word only in the third season when they got uh, knocked down from second officer and yet in the next episode they were the second officer still because they were still fulfilling the role as the second officer still questioning the captain still speaking above the captain still disobeying the captain and then when they were um this uh uh I'm, I'm i am trying to keep myself in check because robert and i did a discussion on this yesterday and i absolutely flipped my fucking lid with their show um, <laughs> so i i am really trying to keep it keep it in, in well, check yeah. at the moment but when even when she was um uh demoted in discovery in season three she had the fucking audacity to turn to a captain and go yeah it's what you should have done. And yeah, I, I just would have punched her in the fucking face until she was dead. If she <laughs> said that to me as the cat, I just would have gone on top and it just would have been raining fucking left and right until there was nothing but a bloody mess. That, that character is the worst character ever created. And because everything's centralized around it, 
By the way, this is how boring the Picard trailer was. We're now just talking Discovery. That's how bad it was. It, 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 the whole show centers around her, and everything that's caught in her orbit turns to shit. Everything. But by the way, hi Gary. Hi, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry <laughs> man. I, we were right in the midst of a rant, so I didn't get, even get a chance to introduce you. <laughs> Wait, okay. Sorry, dude. It's fine. I, I wouldn't want. I'm sorry. I'm late. So, hi everybody. Thanks. Hello, uh, sir. Hello. Uh, I, I, just I, keep, say, I keep forgetting. Like when we say nine o'clock, like your streams usually start 15 minutes later. So, <laughs> actually, I should have factored that in. I'm, uh, but I had to comb my beard. That takes 15 minutes. It's, yeah. And it's Drinker, I just it wanted to follow up something you said. Yes. You, you brought up a great moment in Next Generation history. And after that moment that you talked about, Worf then talks to Data and says, look, I understand our, you know, if we're not friends anymore and, <laughs> and, uh, and he's, a, uh, he, he's embarrassed because he's a Klingon and they get past it. It's like, of course you're my friend. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I have b- command requires these things of me. That doesn't mean I think less of you, you know? And, and I think that that's something that, that is, is completely lost. It's all about, Oh, you hurt. I hurt your feelings. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we're in a military yeah. command structure and we exactly. need to have, we need to have discipline. Otherwise uh, we're not going to survive. No, no, and, we don't Robert. That's, no, that's we don't. What- yeah. What we need is we need a captain that leaves the ship so that the second in command can become captain. And then when they leave the ship, <laughs> instead of passing it to the next competent person, go to some ensign who was crying her fucking eyes out for the whole show. And, and there's a couple of episodes before was thinking about quitting it all anyway, because she can't cope with this shit. And they say, Hey, do you know what? You're now the captain of the ship. And if I was in yeah. any of those command roles in the ship, I'd be like, fuck, fuck this. Fuck, the, fuck these yeah. clowns. These, this is ridiculous. And then she had a ship taken from her in and the, 10 and the writers, minutes. And the writer's room is congratulating themselves. We're going to show little girls any, everywhere that just anybody can be a captain. And that's not actually true. Not no. anybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's yeah. the ultimate example of every kid gets a trophy. And it's a toxic, that way yeah. lies ruin. We, we, we are going right off a cliff with that one. Well, We're imagine gonna... what happens when these people try to apply that to their real lives. You know, they get out of uh, they get out of school or, you know, college in a lot of cases. And they're like, yeah, it's cool. I, I'm just perfect the way I am. And, like, everyone just needs to deal with it. And, you know, they get into actual jobs where they're expected to perform. And there's, like, a thousand other people who are, like, better at it than they are. Uh, and they need to lift their game. And they don't do it. What the fuck? Like they're they're gonna get fired. They're they're not gonna last five minutes. You know, you're not preparing people for the challenges of real life. Oh, we're there, man. (laughs) We're here in our country. (laughs) It was hard hard work is an anathema to people. Come on. It it is a noticeable change. I had uh, there was like a generational shift, you know, in the mid in the early two thousands, the first decade, and my first group of employees at the comic store from like two thousand three to two thousand five were fucking awesome didn't have to tell them to do anything they were happy to be working at a comic store when i told them to do yeah. hard work like you want to alphabetize some comics and 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 price them they're like yeah the second group uh oh, lifting comic books is heavy and it's hard <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jeez. we're doomed yeah man it's it's you know i i've said this and i've made this point about so many franchises and so many movies where the the values that are that they used to instill in you and if there was any message then it was usually about you know a person rising to the challenge that was presented to them and showing real like steel and determination and gumption to like become better drag themselves up to overcome this great obstacle that was in their path uh, and it was about teaching people the value of perseverance and resilience it was important things that will serve you well in life uh, and yeah, now we just teach people the exact opposite. We teach people that you know you're you're a victim, you're oppressed, and the world just needs to apologize to you and and uh, you know and and make amends to you. And it all it'll all happen if you just tell people to do better. And it's just that's not that's not how you're going to get through life. It's it's breeding an entire generation of whiny losers, um, and it's such a shame because they take this stuff in, and they're not bad people to begin with. But it turns them into assholes as a result of this stuff. 
Well, and, and also the <laughs> idea that that feelings that you're supposed to feel good or feel I don't know where that came from. I mean, yeah. we live we live in a on a planet that's been a charnel house through most of history. I mean, we are our, our humanity's uh, uh, normal uh, place is is not a happy place. <laughs> it's conflict. It's being chased by predators, whether it's on the African veldt or you know somebody from an opposing political viewpoint that has a a, a a gun that's going to string you up by the balls and and kill you. And this idea that, hey, you know, if, if you feel this way, we, we need to make sure you feel okay. Where did that even come from? We live in a universe it's, it's where our son, our son can go nova and destroy the entire history of humanity, wipe us from existence. So Mark. we need to toughen up, man. I, I, I think, yeah, this is what happens when there's no real challenges anymore. You know, what, what's that saying? It's like... Um, Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. And so you end up with that endless cycle. And you know the, this is where we're at. We've had our good times, and we've created weak men. And you know, guess what's going to happen next? <laughs> like, you know, I read an article this week that we talked about American colleges and how uh, young men are dropping out of colleges in record rates. Yeah, and more so than ever before, they're leaving higher education because they feel they have no place there that's terrible honestly if i was in a place wh which no. actively hated me i wouldn't want to fucking go yeah. there anyway yeah. i don't play I, them that's, in the place absolutely go go to fucking trade school man learn learn yeah. to become a, an electrician or a plumber or a, or a joiner or something yeah and you'll be set for life you'll be making oh, 100k a year no problem yep oh yeah be an auto mechanic right now they're they're dying for auto mechanics there's a there's a huge labor shortage in in uh in manual labor, uh, uh, blue collar labor, and uh, that has been there. It's been there for a decade. Yep. Uh, and I remember, you know, I was when I was uh, selling auto parts. They, they they were off. God, they were offering the train people from scratch one hundred twenty five thousand a year. I mean, just yeah. to going. Uh, yeah, or or you could take your gender studies class and make nothing. That's fine. Uh, and it's hard work, but you don't have to do it forever. Uh, there's good retirement plans, and it can take you into another job where it's like, uh, you, you know, once you become a master tech, you can go to other places. It's not as hard and make three times as much money. And that's just in the auto industry. And I know Tesla, which is a great place to work, trains and everything from the ground up. So yep. they're just looking for smart people. I mean, you know, for all the the, the flack elon musk gets in the world i mean the guy launched four civilians into space yesterday yes yep. one of them was a billionaire but one of them was a cancer survivor who was in basically a nurse you know a caregiver That's awesome and, the, the, and, the and, thing and, yeah i i i will give they're them in orbit the right now <laughs> yeah but because the thing is like he's the guy who's going to get us off this fucking rock and onto other rocks you know and as much as you want to criticize him for being like an, uh, you know, a stunt man and just like pulling all these publicity stunts and being kind of an asshole, well, ultimately they're they're the kind of people who get things done. And if you are waiting for NASA to get us to Mars or the Moon, <laughs> we will all be old men on our deathbeds before that happens. Well, it's not going to happen. It takes people like him, and it takes companies like SpaceX to get that done now. Well, I have to say, you know, <laughs> three days, two days ago. They did a launch here in California at Vandenberg Air Force Base, and I was watching the launch live, and I walked out on my deck in the backyard, and I, I, I watched Elizabeth, my girlfriend, I said, come out here. She's like, what? And I go, this rocket that just lifted off, we watched it go all the way across the night sky, and we could see it with our, with our eyes, and I said, that's the new SpaceX launch. It was like, it was like Gattaca. In the movie yeah. Gattaca, they're constantly launching rockets all the time. You know, you know, Ethan Hawke wants to, he's not genetically superior, so he, he wants to be an astronaut and he achieves his goal. We're here, man. We're in the future. And if people want to work and, 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 and apply themselves, we're having, SpaceX had two launches this week. Yeah. <laughs> one from California and one from Florida. And this is an amazing time of technological advancement for people that want to apply themselves and bust their asses. There is yeah. great deeds to be done here.
I, I think 20 years from now, we'll be living in a world where we've got colonies on the moon and Mars and, and all that good stuff and we're expanding outward. It's just, this is the time when it's finally happening. And here's the thing, like if you had, you know, NASA or a government agency that was in charge of say, you know, commercial air travel, it would cost you $100,000 per ticket to fly from like London to New York and you'd have to book it 12 years in advance. Oh, you know, it, it, let me give you a good story. There's a, there's a, a high-speed rail here in the state of California. <laughs> it, was to start, it was supposed to open this year, or last year. It was supposed to connect San Francisco and Los Angeles, and they even had dreams of connecting Oakland and San Diego. And it was going to be state-of-the-art. It was only going to cost $10 billion. Some people <laughs> Nah, I don't think that's I don't think that's realistic. Everybody said, nah, nah, you're just, you know, you know bullshit. We can do it. Um, so here we are in 2021. Uh, it's 40 billion dollars over budget, not a piece of track connects to another piece of track. And <laughs> uh, it breaks your heart, man. It breaks your heart. China would have built it in a year. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And when yeah. it's finished, and they would have apologized for the delay. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, same as yeah. If it finishes, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if I got the towns right, but I think it's something like uh, Sacramento and Merced or yeah. Stockton and Merced. Like, two, like You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. It's like two, uh, nobody's traveling between Stockton and Merced. I mean, like, that's you could drive that. That's no problem. It was supposed to alleviate traffic. And, you know, because there's, uh, I mean, the, 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 tra the traffic is packed between on Interstate 5 between LA and San Francisco. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's the state. That's the state uh, running stuff right into the ground, wasting fifty billion dollars of of our money. Uh, by the Perry, way, Perry, you're so. so right. And you know, if if people go back and you look at the history, the post World War II history of America, when they wanted to build our highway system, they did it. Yeah, <laughs> they they, they crisscrossed America with highways. I mean, I, I'm from Seattle. When I first moved to California, I used to drive back and forth to Seattle all the time. It's amazing that you could just get in your car, and if I would, I could make my record was 18 and a half hours, Seattle to LA Ooh. that you can just do that. You know, you have the infrastructure and, and you'd think that, wow, high speed rail, it'd be fantastic. And yet we can't get it together to California, our, our economy, <laughs> everybody wants a taste. Everyone wants to dip their toes in it. We can't have like, we, we, we are incapable. Our government is incapable of accomplishing things. And we used to be able to, Elon Musk is going to go to the moon before before NASA is going to have viable spacesuits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, NASA's they're still testing their spacesuits, and I am watching four civilians in orbit. You know, I, in, I, I, in, I mentioned this on Twitter a while back. Like NASA's busy designing their new spacesuits for going on the moon, um, and it's going to take them about you know fifteen years, and it's going to cost two hundred billion or whatever. And my response was like, "Wait, didn't you design them back in the sixties? Yeah, like, did you just has, has one the moon from changed that much? In that time? Yeah. It's like Neil Armstrong's just like, nip, you know he's gone now. Ask if you can borrow his. Talk about reinventing the wheel, Jesus Christ! You had it nailed already. Just make more." I mean, that's, we that's haven't been to the joke, moon since anyway. 1972. Yeah. 1972. Yeah, that's pretty depressing. Well, that's because we keep getting killed by Transformers and that's people true. coming out of the Phantom Zone. That's, You're that's right. the problem, yeah. Or, or General Zod, you know, he's on the moon mm -hmm. blowing up the lunar landers and stuff like yeah. that. Asshole. It's, there's always some problem. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, speaking of interplanetary stuff, I was going to ask you guys what your thoughts are on Dune. Dune. Um... Obviously, it's starting to hit cinemas now in selected international like markets. Not in the it, UK, though. Obviously, that would be too convenient. For it me. did very well in France. Too many white yesterday. people in it. That's what I've heard. What was that? There's too many white people in it, or white savior? White savior. That's the, yeah, yeah. That's the big problem. That that's the state of our journalism at the moment. Really, like that's their biggest criticism. It's Literally, like yeah, the, it's first the white thing savior saw, thing going on. First thing I saw about the movie was that and I was like, okay. Could, that, I don't care. Can someone talk about the story? Yeah. Well, uh, and that's that's literally taking the, the the portion of the first book that this movie actually revolves around and just using that as your baseline without knowing anything about where the books go. Because uh, Paul, as a messiah <laughs> kind of figure, is not the 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 white savior that he's made out to be. Uh, you no. know, he ultimately becomes something very human and very flawed. And billions and billions of people die. Yeah. 
But it's like they don't know that because they're dumb as fuck and they don't read the books and they don't do any research. They just go, oh, white protagonist, bad. And that's the, about the, the depth of your your journalism. Oh, there. By, by the way, that, that um, review, which uh, called, well, this is not called out, that complained about there being a, the white savior trope, uh, gave the film 10 out of 10. Yeah. <laughs> 10 out of 10 and still had in the negative part uh white savior falls they just out. have to they just have to get a criticism in don't they but this and, is this is my oh sorry go ahead no i was real quick um you know what why can't we have a fucking white savior or a black savior or a savior it, like these are stories we should be able to write and enjoy and i know that's not the story i know what happens in do but i'm just talking separately why does that mm. even why is that even a fucking thing we're talking about stories so sick of this crap that's what's been introduced in the fandom that wasn't really there before it's been there around the edges and stuff but people just wanted to enjoy a story and why don't we just let it play out and find out i haven't read i've tried to read that book 10 times i can't get into it but um i'm gonna go see the movie and i'm looking forward to it i hope it's fucking great go on robert sorry well no i was just gonna say that dune takes place ten thousand years in the future and um there, like, there are no indigenous people on Arrakis. It was all people that went there and and settled. The Fremen there have been there the longest. And what's frustrating is that people are criticizing. When I was when I was a kid growing up, uh, I was nine years old when I joined the science fiction book club because every paperback science fiction book that I read, the the Princess of Mars, you know, by by uh, that I read all of the Barsoom books. And it would always have in the middle of the book, uh, 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 join the science fiction book club. And so I did. And when I was nine, the Dune series, I, th there was only three Dune books then. I got them. I didn't read them until I was like 12. Um, but how could you criticize Dune? It's been around. It's part of the great canon of science fiction works. And, and to talk about it as a white sa savior myth, just there's a cursory glance on the internet. Go to Wikipedia and read about Frank Herbert's six Dune books and, and read what they're about. Like before you write your, your, your review, do a cursory amount of research because yeah. we have this great thing called the internet. It's amazing. You just type in a word on your search, on your, uh, on your, and suddenly all the information you want, 10 minutes of reading can give you everything you need to know about Dune before you write the review and accuse it of having some white savior myth well th but there's another does that th there's an interview as well with rebecca ferguson who's in the film oh, and man. um it's the most Dude. obnoxious nonsense i think i've heard in in months I i'm not gonna say years because it's that kind of time that we live in um <laughs> but it's where the interviewer is praising like the the depiction of characters like lady jessica uh, as being it. powerful and strong and interesting and well developed, and and she's like, oh yeah, we're giving so much praise to Frank Herbert, but uh, you know because he almost hit the mark, but it's just not good enough. There has to be more. And I keep thinking, what the fuck do you want? Do you just want every single character in this story to be female? Would that satisfy you? Like, if you you have any knowledge of Dune as a story, the women pretty much manipulate every major event that happens for thousands story. of years. They have been manipulating events, but that's still not enough. Like, what more <laughs> can you do? How can you play? 10, how can you play victim when you've got strong characters, though? Yeah, everything's a victim narrative. That's that's that's. We don't have heroes' journeys anymore. We have victim narratives. So even when our uh, actors are giving interviews, they're all talking about how victimized they were in filming, how victim, how it's it's a triumph and a, and a fucking um, you know it, it's groundbreaking that we've even got black people in films or women in films, and it's just such obnoxious gaslighting that that goes on nowadays. Is it? And I think it, that there's some sort of inflation of their own ego that they're desperate to do and uh, i did a video a couple of days ago about uh, uh lasagna lynch in uh, the new bond film and uh, how obnoxious she was uh in thinking that being a black woman in bond was it was a groundbreaking uh event a groundbreaking phenomenon 
And it's just like, just look at all the, you know, the people who come before you uh, from Thumper and Diamonds of Forever, Halle Berry, Grace Jones, uh, Live and Let Die as well. And it, and it's just it's just this obnoxious bullshit uh, that they <clears throat> spout. And then she says, oh, and then when there was backlash, when there was backlash to, to me being uh, potentially 007, I felt as if, I felt as if we were back in the, the segregation age <laughs> where, there, where there were certain roles that weren't allowed for people like me. And you're just like, oh, go fuck yourself. Yeah, just like, shut, when, when shut she, up and go fuck yourself. You I mean, not just bitch. When, yeah, like when is she going to realize it's not about the color of your skin or the, the your gender or anything like that? It's because you're being an asshole. That's yes. why people don't <laughs> like you. You know, it, it's like the, the early trailers really emphasized her as being this replacement for Bond. She was smarter than him. She was telling him to stay in his lane and get out of her way. Interestingly enough, the, the most recent trailers barely show her. Uh -huh. It's like the, the producers of the movie have realized, oh, wow, like she's really not popular. We need to, we need to ditch this one as much as we can. Mm. Well, and that's, I mean, A View to a Kill came out in 1985. And and Bond sleeps with Grace Jones, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. like, um, you know the producers went there and she was an antagonist. She almost killed Bond. And Grace uh, Jones looks like she could kill Roger Moore. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and it's like I mean this this happened and Bambi and Thumper beat the shit out of Sean Connery. So yeah, in, the in problem Diamonds here is in you, 1971. You guys are referencing films they don't know about. They don't know what these things are. Yeah, <laughs> no Not films existed before 2015. Well, True. that's the frustration. No, women part. didn't exist. Black people didn't exist before 2016. Yeah. It was just white man's world until then. This is this is so stunning and brave in this this new world that they've dreamt up in their head that exists now many, because of them. How many historic things have happened today? I mean, well, and Anne Boleyn's still black in the Channel Five. I mean, the the five of us being here at this point doing this, this is historic. Never happened yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Remember How about Yafik Koto? Yafik Just Koto everyone in chat, team. you were here to witness this. <laughs> <laughs> Yafik Koto's team killed a double O in Live and Let Die in 1973. Yep. Yes. In the opening of that movie. I mean, so you had a black criminal organization who was able to kill a British intelligence officer. I'd say that was pretty progressive almost 50 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. Damn! Look at look at the you know look at Terminator Two like the the lead scientist one of the most smartest guys in the movie probably the guy who develops the 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 CPU for the Terminator a black man a brilliant right. genius he's, engineer he's one of the best people too it's literally like he only ever does the best thing he can in every situation throughout the whole film yep even yeah. after getting right. attacked and his family are threatened he still agrees with them to destroy his life's work he's a legend like <laughs> like Dyson. Good guy. Sacri mortally wounded sacrifices his life to give the others a chance to escape and destroy the, the research that he spent his life building up. Oh, what an incredible character. Why do you guys think this is that the pop culture memory is so short? I, I've always said that there's a 20-year lifespan, a half-life of pop culture. But yet, all of this stuff is out there and it has inspired all of us. We've loved it. We've watched it our whole lives. But why is it then suddenly so forgotten? We were on a great path. You know, there was there was great voices. I was talking the other day about Spike Lee's first film, She's Gotta Have It, from 1986. I remember seeing it, black and white film, a perspective in black culture that I hadn't seen. I was like, man, this is great. You know, he blew up the indie film circuit. And I was like, God, a new voice. Amazing. I love this. Because, was, because if, 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 they, if they don't, their gaslighting doesn't hold up. If they if they actually address what has legitimately happened, who has been in film, created film, um, over the course of God knows how many years now, decades upon decades upon decades, then none of their arguments hold any weight whatsoever, and it is just gaslighting. And, 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 and it's, well. it's this. Um, uh, I, I can't. I, I can't remember the the, the well. I mean, the terminology is gaslighting, but it, it, it's as if they're in their own world and you go no there has been this 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 and this throughout history and they're still there going oh and here we are trailblazing no we've just said oh but no here we are trailblazing for the future with our amazing 
I mean, it's I just think it's, it's so obnoxious. I think it's a combination of, 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 of several different things. One, the loudest voices dominate the conversation, and the loudest voices mm. in, in online discourse about pop culture are the ones who are <laughs> progressive um, and who want to pretend like nothing good ever happened before they came on the scene. Mm. There's that. There's the people who don't want to argue with them because they will be labeled as all the, the usual lists of ists and phobes. You know, if you question the narrative that they put out, you're you're immediately um, excommunicated. So there's a lot of people who won't fight back against it. And then when you think about it, like when you're growing up, who is it that introduces you to a lot of, of older movies and, and franchises and stuff like that? It's probably like your dad. How, how many people grow up in households now they don't have a dad? Right. I don't know, man. You know, you're you're missing all of these important links in the chain that connects you to like these these past pop culture icons, these past pop culture events, and without them, you've got nothing to anchor you, and so you just you go with whatever's cool at the moment and what everyone else seems to be saying, and what they're all saying is, yep, yeah, this is what's this is what we need now. You know, there was nothing good before before 2010 or whatever, um, and that's that's the pop culture that you need to adhere to. It's, and it's a real loss. Yeah, it's it's well, it's this overall message that uh, Hollywood's been really been pushing lately that uh, for uh, women to be equal, which they're not anymore, they're losing their own agency. Is you have to de-emphasize the male by you know diminishing his character. Uh, er, er, anything male is patriarchy. Anything male is misogynist. Uh, all, uh, all masculinity is toxic. Um, and you know this is stuff we're born with, and it's actually kind of important. And it's uh, it's the foundation of a lot of our favorite franchise, and it doesn't need, need to dominate it. Um, and it's sexist anyway because women are already equal. They don't they don't need this diminishment. Uh, that this is through Hollywood's lens. They like to say we're looking through your your lens is fucked. You're you're, <laughs> you're the people who've been mistreating women for decades. Somehow you made it the fans' fault. That's that, that's a good sales uh, uh, move right there. I gotta admit, but that's what they're pushing. They're trying to eradicate masculinity of any kind uh and it makes for shitty storytelling basically uh well, aside from what it and and you know yeah boys don't feel welcome at university they're not going to feel welcome in hollywood uh i, I think yeah, you know I, welcome in elementary school right now so sorry Drake. no no i'm uh, sorry i didn't mean to jump in there but yeah i think you're you've really hit it on the head there you know when it comes to um you know, how male and female characters are portrayed. Like, going back to Juno as an example, you know, Frank Herbert realized quite correctly that, like, when it comes to obtaining power, right, women can't do it through physical force and, and, and domination. They don't have that ability because they're not big and strong in the same way that men are, and they can't do it through force of arms. So they do it through, through manipulation in, in his books. They do it through persuasion, and and um and infiltration that's what the whole bene Gesserit, you know organization is about they manipulate things behind the scenes and, and they're so really understood. good at it they're really good at it yeah. yeah and ultimately they're they're really the ones who pull all the strings uh, and set in motion most of the events of the stories not that the the male characters are completely without um, agency of their own but ultimately they're being misled into doing the things that uh, these women want them to do he understood that and he implemented it really effectively into his story. Now you're not allowed to do that. Now you have to imply that women are just as physically powerful and dominant as men and they can they can force them to do what they want to do. And so you have female characters that are essentially just men, but played by female actresses. Uh, mm -hmm. And it just it creates this weird disconnect in your head where you just think, no, this this feels weird and wrong. I don't really buy into this in the slightest. But then, if you question it, you're you're then told that you're the problem. But, it's, but you it's you, you don't buy into it because done. your your natural instincts as a human being is telling you this is not possible. Yeah, you know because your you, your your primal instinct of of how you know musculature works and and strength works. It, you when we see you know you can believe the odd one. You know you can believe like a highly trained martial artist. Yes. Um, you can believe something along those lines, but we're but we're literally just seeing waves, just these these waves of people 
punching a man in the face, you know, just doing a regular like punch in the face. <laughs> and we we just we just fucking we would laugh that off as a man. You know, if you just you just be like what the well, fuck was that? There, there's a scene in Sicario where um, Emily Blunt tries to tries to lamp um, Josh Brolin, and he just shrugs it off and knocks her on her ass. And I think that's yeah. kind of how these fights would actually play out in the real world, um, where where you don't have accommodating stuntmen, um, as I once said. Um, yeah, like, but there, you know, there's characters like Mahler, like we've discussed, like Sarah Connor in Terminator Two, where you know you've got this badass. Um, female character who can who can do um who can fight and who can defend herself but she's not written to an extreme degree where she's suddenly stronger than guys twice her size like she's no. still ultimately limited by her, her, her size and, and strength but she compensates yeah, the, um, for that by just being really you know good at what she does the orderly still take her down uh yeah mm-hmm. together and that you know they're not like absur- they're not muscle men they're all regular men who work there some some women uh, but that's the that's the reality. When you have got enough people who grabbing a limb each, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Well, you know. Um, to, well, to speak to her character, one of the things I love about Aliens is uh, Cameron wrote the the motherly instinct as a strong plus, a character trait that a man doesn't have, and you actually have a confrontation between two mothers. You know, mm-hmm. men couldn't have done that. You know, yeah. I don't think a man could have walked in with a flamethrower into a, a, a hive where the alien queen was and survived. But she can because she's there to rescue Newt and, and, and threatens the eggs and all that. And what's really interesting is we've forgotten that the strength of femininity and the strength of motherhood is different than the strength of maleness. And we need both. You know, it's yeah. that uniqueness that that and, and Sarah Connor ultimately same kind of thing. She der- derives her strength from her femininity, from her motherhood. You know, to save her son. Well, ultimately, and, she yeah, she's motivated to protect John, isn't she? And and that's that's something men don't have. And what's amazing is that is a feminine quality that gives a woman a strength that men can never have. And and that's awesome and cameron taps into that without denigrating the male characters but he he, he taps into something uh, uh, the 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 life-giving force is not something to be feared it's not something to be denigrated it's something to be celebrated and cameron does that and he shows ripley as a goddamn badass walking into the lair of the alien queen where men fear to tread because she's a mother confronting another mother and that's yeah. badass yeah. just want an honorable mention to fatherhood though <laughs> well yeah i mean fatherhood's great too but it's different and we should yeah. celebrate both and and yet you know now like uh uh you know families people are created because men and women get together and uh we have different things mm. to offer well, yeah just obviously referencing stuff like man on fire or um even oh, Last of Us, you know, like it's a the father uh, child dynamic can be powerful as hell as well. Incredible. Yes. And by the way, Man on Fire, dude, how great is that movie? Oh, that's fucking and, great. And, and, <laughs> cre- and crazy. I mean, here's a guy. Here's a guy who is a broken man, and the impulse to be a father is what gives him the strength to continue on. Amazing, amazing yeah. film. And that, that's the great thing, you know, you can tell these stories that, that portray the, the positive sides of fatherhood and motherhood. You know, I, I, you know the, the old quote is like, if you, you think women aren't dangerous, then get between a mom and her kids. Yep. You know, um, but it, it, it's just like now you're never allowed to do that. You're, you're not allowed to portray women in a sort of motherhood role or a, a protector role like that because it's... It's almost like you're going to get accused of saying, "Well, are you are you saying that women can only ever just be mothers? That's their only role." And you know, you get that line in, in Terminator: Dark Fate, where, where no, Sarah Connor no. talks about that, no. where she says, "Oh, we're just what is it? We're just there to breed and produce." The, no, the... it's not canon. <laughs> no. Yeah, it is more. It no. can never be undone. <laughs> yeah. There is no fake to what we make, and I ain't making that fucking shit. Life. <laughs> 
that's all um, Dude, making Sarah Connor traditional to make a bunch of money and collect stuff. That's making meaningless. making Sarah Connor bitter about being a mother was one of the most fucking insulting things you could have done with that character. Yeah, it was so like the moment she said it, I was just like no. part of me just kind of died a little bit. Like, yeah, I don't want to be, dark I don't is, be watching this film. Is it's the ultimate abomination? It really is. I'm it, a, it, it's it's every second of that is to tear down Terminator and a lot of other things, and you know, uh, the, it's. I mean, the first like, two minutes, they killed John Connor. So, some of my oldest memories include when I first saw Terminator One and Two. They are in, etched into my soul. Watching Genesis and Dark Fate, man, it's just painful. They're both so painful. When you're reading the Mary Sue article, which I did, I did a video <laughs> on this. And they break down perfectly how Arnold is a drape apologist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a draper. I was like, oh, my God, they're right. Uh, which I don't like being in the position of saying very much, but they were right. I couldn't. I, it just made it worse. <laughs> you know? And that's not like something I even got on the first viewing. And I had to watch it again, which was I think I'm. I think I said on the because I did a stream when I'd seen that movie when I came back, and the only thing I liked about the entire movie was when uh, Arnie sees uh, the new Terminator coming at him, and we get a POV view from him, and it's the same as it should have been from the old Terminators. And I was like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> See, that reminds you, like it. Th there's this. Th it doesn't really exist, but there's this other Indiana Jones movie. Oh yeah crystal something or other there's like a moment <laughs> at the school where it feels like an indiana jones movie it's like it's like yeah. a, about a second and I, yeah it's the same thing Mahler is like oh it makes me hate it more because that's really <laughs> continued but there's only three indiana jones movies there's only this three. is what um yafit koto said uh he said about james bond he cannot be black Political correctness be damned. We have to stay with what is literally correct. James Bond was established by Ian Fleming as a white character played by white actors. Play 003 or 006, but you cannot be 007. A lot of people say we should be allowed to play everything. Don't be ridiculous. If I say I want to play JFK or Anne Boleyn, I should be laughed out of the room. Black men should stop trying to play roles created by whites. These roles are not written for black men. We have pens to create roles that no one else has established. Uh, yeah. it's, it's the laziness of Hollywood. It's the laziness. It's it's it is. It's it's laziness, mm -hmm. and it's all about making content. Uh, Robert, I was watching you uh, talk about the the possible sale of Paramount couldn't agree with you more because uh th that's you know when when they when uh cheeks tried to justify giving alex kurtzman 150 million dollars what what was his justification this guy can make stuff he can make <laughs> stuff fast oh it doesn't matter it doesn't have to be fucking good or anything when i saw this alex guy kurtzman, can make a kid appear in my bedroom at uh, when i saw alex kurtzman walk into my office i knew he was the right man for the job that's a quote from uh cheeky boy over at uh, viacom the director of norbit yeah, that's who's running freaking uh, Paramount right now. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. The yeah. director of Norbit is now running. I mean, okay. Oscar, Robert, Oscar winning Norbit. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I honestly, I have to say that I, I am so depressed about what's happening to Paramount. Um, uh, Jim Giannopoulos, a man who makes movies, was ousted. Ousted for a streamer who works for the guy who ran Nickelodeon. I mean, Jim Giannopoulos was was one of the great movie executives that Hollywood had, old school dudes, and he was just sent packing in and, and favor why? of a guy that ran Nickelodeon. Tell the audience why they're doing all this. I don't know if they've heard. Uh, I, well, you mentioned you heard a rumor uh, that in a couple of years, Paramount's going to be doing what? Um, Paramount, by, tw by 2024, is not interested in putting movies in theaters. What they want to do is they just want to make mid-level, lower-budget material that they're going to feed to Paramount Plus, and oh, they are going. God, to, that's depressing. They're going to exit theatrical distribution altogether. <laughs> they're now, going to exit stage left. That's what they're going to do. Well, it, it, it's very frustrating because you know <clears> Paramount <throat> is the studio of The Godfather. 
Is the studio of Chinatown? Is the studio of Star Trek? Well, Ready Saturday Night Hulk. Fever. I mean, it's even fun. Tom Clancy, the the Hunt for Red October. Yay! I, I uh, oh, thank you. Just Tom. reviewed that, dude. I know. <laughs> and let, let me just tell you, one of the greatest movies ever made. Uh, it it, it it's incredibly frustrating to um, see that that you know great storytelling is no longer the focus of entertainment. <clears throat> just creating content is it doesn't matter what it is get it on your streaming service because everyone's going to pay $15 a month which stabilizes the income of studios that they never had before because every movie was a crapshoot which means people had to really put their heart and souls into films to make them great now eh, just doesn't matter whatever as long as there's something new on the platform every week people will come back but what about uh, the content are... era? What about greatness? What about great stories, man? No. What, what about, <laughs> you know, I, I, I know. No. You know, Cur uh, Lucas, George Lucas, harked back to Kurosawa's movies to make Star Wars. I wonder if J.J. Abrams ever saw a Kurosawa film. <laughs> I'm not sure he's actually seen a film. He, yeah. I, I, I wonder if J.J. Abrams has watched Star Wars. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> he certainly never watched well, the Star yeah, Trek episode. I don't know. I'll tell you that. Him. I would say he did watch New Hope with how much he stole from it. Like, you know, well, like, yeah. <laughs> Someone <laughs> gave him the cliff notes or something. Um, I wanted to throw a monkey wrench in here, right? So if we go one by one and I'll go last, um, who's your dream cast for the next Bond if, if things were going well? And try to keep speculation low, just go with a name. Hopefully we don't double up on any. We're, we're uh, probably going to double up, but... Uh, I'll go first because I'm on the top left. If that's okay, um, yeah, I would, I would cast Henry Cavill for sure. Um, he's got the look. He's got the, the. He's about the right age. He's he's got the accent already. Uh, yeah, he could absolutely play Bond. He would nail it. Oh, you remember to me? Uh, I I would I would absolutely agree. Uh, Henry Cavill to Bond for me. Uh I have to say somebody new. I would go with Richard Madden based on his performance in Bodyguard, this six-episode BBC series, which I thought he was terrific in. Of course, he's in Eternals, and he was Rob Stark in Game of Thrones, but I'm just saying that because I would love Henry Cavill. Uh, have you seen Man from U.N.C.L.E.? Come on, man. Yeah, he yeah, nailed it. U.N.C.L.E.'s the shit. That's good. Uh, shit. I got to be different. Tom Hardy. No, oh, not bad. All right. Here comes the monkey wrench. I'm just going to watch you guys' faces as I say this. How Radjington also on you. Idris Elba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who can go one better here? Tessa Thompson. Tessa I'm not Thompson. joking. I, I'm not joking. Why, why, why would you want a man who's going to... If, like, the next Bond film after this one is going to come out in, let's say, three years. Let's be generous. Say three years. First of all, you've got to find your new Bond. Then you've got to get a whole new setup. Then you've got to get your director, your blah, blah, blah. So let's say three years from now. So 2024. Generous. Idris Elba is going to be what? Agreed. Seven by then? Agreed. Entirely on your point, which is why I probably wouldn't cast him. However, I think I'm trying to make a different point here because obviously I'm probably the only person out of the five of us that is on a different <laughs> team with this. I think in his prime... He would have made one of the best Bonds ever. He's like incredibly charming. He's quintessentially British. He, I think he, he could pull off the role really he well. Is, he could absolutely play a spy in the mold of James Bond. Like you say, he's got the charisma. He's 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 got the charm. He's got the accent. Um, but like, I mean, I hate to be the guy to say it, but James Bond is written as a white man. Yeah, like, and I don't think you can really like sidestep that to cast someone like Idris Elba. Unfortunately. Uh, but hang and that's on. not me. That's not me hating on Idris Elba. I love the guy, but like he is—he's not the the guy to play Bond. I think. But I, it, it, I, I would say this as a lifelong Bond fanatic. I have a, 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 a an original American one sheet of Doctor No hanging in my bedroom. I am a huge James Bond fan. Idris Elba could have the the idea that the that the if if. Daniel Craig dies. I don't know what happens if if the if Bond dies or whatever. The 007 moniker is up for grabs. You could have Idris Elba slide into that and be a double O. 
the 007 character. So he wouldn't be James Bond. He'd be 007. And I Th- this is some, yeah, this is something they've never really clarified in no, the whole No, and I think it, I, is I, it is it just different guys who have taken well, on 007? The I think Koto James- quote specified 007 too. And that's the thing. I actually wouldn't do it the way I wouldn't cast him as James Bond. I probably would cast him as a new 007 agent. Yep. If yeah. I could have a preference. Yeah, give him a spin-off. Yeah. And I I, um, I I think it would be I, I love it. Look, I didn't even know Idris Elba was was British when I watched The Wire. He's like Mahler said, an incredibly charismatic actor, and if you know he's he's been searching whether it's the Dark Tower or whether it's Pacific Rim, no one has done right by Idris Elba yet. He he deserves he yeah, deserves man. that yeah. starring role where everything he brings to the screen is realized. He's tried so hard. People have tried to. But he needs that role that defines him, and he hasn't been given it, and it's it's frustrating. Well, he's yeah. had Luther. Luther's been a great role for him. Lu- uh, Luther's well, Luther was great, but ultimately it's just a TV show uh, in the UK. Most he of didn't. Um, his name but, didn't quite get to where I think it probably deserved to be. Um, especially after watching the Suicide Squad, I was like, man, this guy can carry a film. Why isn't he in more action? And then I, was, I checked his age, and I was like, oh fuck, he's not. He's not going to be doing this much longer. Like these kinds of roles. Yeah, I mean, he's what fifty. Forty-nine, something like that. Uh, he's in his fifties at the moment, early fifties. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, he's uh, yeah, he's not going to be doing this for too much longer, and it's a shame because he he's funny, 40, you know, he's, he's charismatic. He's a good actor. He can kind of play, you know, he can play pretty much anything essentially. And it's just it feels like he's never quite hit it. I don't know if he just maybe, you know, he came in a little bit late in his career. Like he hit the big time and he got that recognition when he was already getting on a little bit, and he's just maybe yeah. missed the boat. And it's a yeah. shame. He was rumored to to have turned down Doctor Who. Neil Gaiman. Oh man! So, so this what was could have been? What he would have been the thirteenth Doctor? It was prior to Capaldi. Uh, that was the rumor, anyway. That Capaldi um, was the first choice. Can I, can I just say as well, just before we go on, oh. Count Dankula's in the room. Right, how's it going, man? I'm sorry we didn't quite get a chance to welcome you when you first came in. <laughs> no, no, no so I'm, I'm I'm good, man. I'm fine. How are how, how are we doing? All right, mate. Are you are you broadcasting from your shitter right now? <laughs> no, no, I'm in the I'm in my kitchen because uh, my my wife's asleep. Oh, <laughs> so I get I get I get cast in of the house so I can actually do streams and shit. What I was gonna no. say, by the way, just in relation to all these casting choices, like it's all a disaster anyway because the people who are writing them. That's like, yep. If yeah, we had yeah, yeah. in any of these roles, he's still fucked because the people who are writing him. Yeah, this is true. Um, yeah. It, like I know, what is it? Um, Jodie Whittaker and Chris Chibnall are both leaving Doctor Who <laughs> after this season. As um, if it will get better. <laughs> I know, like they're just going to replace them with someone just as no, bad, man. They had Peter Capaldi, and they screwed it up, even with Moffat there, and that he was freaking great. He was fantastic, yeah. you know, and such a waste. Yeah. Uh, uh, and apparently not their first choice, but uh, although that goes against what Mo- Moffat said, but well, you never know. Nice to meet yeah. you, Count Dankula. His first time. Uh, yes, sir. I, yes. My, oh. Nice to meet you as well, sir. Uh, I was going to ask you, Dank, because uh, I know you, you'd uh, you'd watched the Matrix Four trailer. Um, what, what was your what was your feelings about that? Do you, do you feel like this is going to be like the epic return to form that we've we've all waited for? <laughs> um, I, I I wasn't sure if I was watching the Matrix trailer or a trailer for a Saints Row clone. <laughs> 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 or some shit. I don't, I don't know why I was watching it, and like the problem was because he's got his fucking long hair. I was like, this is this is nerdy John Wick, like he, yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 man. And the, like Mor- Morpheus, like well the the guy I, I believe I assume is supposed to be Morpheus looks like someone that would get cast in one of those parody movies like Meet yeah. the Spartans. <laughs> yeah. Dude, he's the fucking porn version. <laughs> he, he's just he's got just enough of a resemblance to Lawrence Fishburne that you're like, ah, he could maybe do it, but then ah, it's it's just like a weird reworked version of him that's obviously mm. about, you know, five stone lighter. That's bullshit yeah. from what I've heard too, because like didn't my Lawrence Fishburne say he wasn't contacted at all for the film? Yeah, that's what he said. Mm. He must have done something to piss off the Wachowskis then for them to not want him back at oh, all. Well, one, so of, one, they, of the, one of the Wachowskis isn't involved in the project whatsoever. Yeah. Ah, like, so you've got Lana like, yeah. who's doing the whole thing, basically. Yeah. And, uh, and 
she uh, on her Twitter bio literally has, I'm not involved in the Matrix movie. Stop asking me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Damn. Something, yeah, something happened there as well. Well, from what I know as well, the, the Matrix story was continued by other writers in, I can't remember what medium it was. It could have been books or games or whatever. And the, the which house you gave, they gave um, permission to like continue the canon or whatever. And um, Morpheus was killed in it. So. There is a question of like, do they have a hate boner for Morpheus? What's going on? Because um, I don't know about you guys, but like when I think of the Matrix, often thinking about Morpheus after in those pills with the glasses and the the mm -hmm. atmosphere, not necessarily Neo. I know, I know that sounds a bit weird, but it's like it's just he's iconic to me, and it's just like, huh, he's um not going to be in it. Well, this guy is going to be in it. Totally not Morpheus, but I don't well, know. There, there's so much like, you know, Trinity's going to be in it. She got killed when she wasn't even connected to the Matrix, so well, I don't yeah. know why the fuck she's still there. All of that is fine because they re they can just do whatever they want rules-wise, right? That's the era we're in. They're going to make whatever they want. Palpatine came back, guys. He got vaporized twice. <laughs> <laughs> They'll come. They'll bring whoever they want back. They'll just say the re the Matrix reset or the the um you know at the end of Revolutions where they say that like a new Matrix is starting up again. That's probably yeah. what we're dealing with. And I do love because he was filming. I think John Wick four and five um, yeah. at the same time. So he just he just looks like John Wick. There's just no difference. It's yeah, like, like Keanu Reeves just doesn't give a fuck. He's like, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be in your shitty Matrix movie, but I'm not shaving my beard off or cutting my hair or any of that crap. <laughs> I think well, he cares more about John Wick at this point, which makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I would too. I well. would, yeah. It's one, much better. Yeah. One thing that I noticed, and I don't know why, but this was a little, it was a little silly thing that annoyed me is, you know how one of the things that uh, made the Matrix movie like sort of stand out, and it was a nice visual effect, even though it was basic, the green tint, the yeah. green tint when yeah. they were in the Matrix, like throughout the trailer, I didn't see any of that. Like, I, I think... I, I'm I, assuming because you know at the end of the last Matrix movie how there's like that that lovely sunset that uh, the mm -hmm. little girl creates and it's like a much more uh, what would you call it like it's a much more accurate version of the Matrix it looks more like our world you know there's trees and grass and the, the sky actually looks like normal sky I think that was meant to mean like that it's been improved in some way so it's less like the original Matrix it's like a yeah. it's like a gradual iteration or something of would it would you call it That's a vanilla <laughs> sky. <laughs> um, as, as it just has been 20 years the Matrix now runs on a Samsung 1080p curved monitor <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no green tint anymore man That's a, like, it doesn't run in a well, Commodore 64 like in 1999 this is the, I, this is the thing like, see when you look at um, you know, the, the fashions and stuff of the original Matrix you know, everyone's dressed up in their leather hot pants and like their, their big trench coats and their sunglasses indoors and stuff. They were trying imagine, to be inconspicuous. Imagine doing that, fucking <laughs> kind of wanker would do that. Um, yeah, every, every, everybody knew that wanker in school when the Matrix came out, they turned up to school with a fucking <laughs> oh, trench coat yeah. on, like everybody knew a guy, at least one like that. <laughs> Um, it, was, it was blood in the water, honestly, at my school. But um, and, and would they get bullied for it as well? But I mean, why would you bully the guy literally dressed like a school shooter? <laughs> <laughs> Which actually happened here in the states. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, was, why that 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 style? Like all of it was great for the, like the late nineties, early two thousands. But like that's even that kind of seems a wee bit dated now. The tint. You know, no, just like this, the fashions, the the way the characters are styled and all that. Like it, it just, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, I can look back on the Matrix and just say, like, yep, they're definitely a product of its time, and it was awesome for its day. Uh, it's it's a little bit dated. It's like that fucking late nineties techno f craze that oh, everyone was going through. In a way, a little pop phone. That you yeah, have, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. You wouldn't call a medieval film dated in the same way. The Matrix is based in a particular time, and you can argue that all the characters in the universe dressed similarly and in that way because that that was the style at the time. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pop culture, yeah. and it was cool. Like medieval yeah. fashion was never cool in our like lifespan, but like clearly the Matrix was designed to appeal to like that that sensibility of the late nineteen nineties. I don't want a Matrix 4. I don't know how exactly you guys all feel, certainly not in this fucking day and age, but 
Like I was seeing, yeah. I was just checking out people talking about it, and I saw people saying like, "Where's, where's, uh, where's Hugo Weaving? Where's Agent Smith?" And I was like, "No, why, no?" <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I don't want to see um, middle-aged Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss like trying to fit into their, their leather like fucking hot pants again and try and pretend like they're they're, you know, young and cool and and yeah. doing their high kick and stuff. Like you're you're. You're not going to do that. It's like Bill and Ted, you know, the Bill and Ted movie. I just got an image of them getting out of breath in the middle of fights and shit yeah. like that. He, le- he, le- he leaps across the street on another building and like throws his back out. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, I, I do hope that one of the things about the Matrix, the first Matrix, was we now live in a world that has been irrevocably changed by the internet. And I'm hoping that there is some i've heard there's some meta narrative going on about how like things you know like getting those aol discs in the mail and you've upgraded and upgraded and upgraded the changes in the software or the matrix or the world that we live in i'm hoping that they're like all great science fiction that there is some commentary maybe a meta commentary about our world today and since i mean we're 22 years away from the original matrix yeah my god has the internet shaped our society and and i i I, basically i want to see team america world police but with matrix (laughs) four please give me that the director's uh, cut. The, of yes, America the director's World. cut. Okay, with the, so the, that's I, I know it yeah. seems a little odd, there you go. but I, I I that's what I want from the Matrix. I want it to go full on, uh, <laughs> uh, meta. Matt, I, <laughs> I don't know um, why I got an image of fucking Neo in the room again with all the screens, and the chair just turns around and it's fucking Chris Chan. Hello, Neo. <laughs> 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 the merge is happening. That's all I can say. Um, oh, no. Mentioning Hugo Weaving, by the way, I saw someone in chat say he denied the role, and I was like, oh, shit, really? That would be cool to find out why. But I just I just got an article that so says, Hugo Weaving will not provide reprise his role of Agent Smith in The Matrix 4 after director Lana Wachowski pulled the plug on his return over scheduling concerns. Yeah, apparently, uh, yeah, there was scheduling conflicts. So, I mean, again, like, I just... Uh... What can the agent's going to be true. Agent Johnson in this one. Scheduling conflict. Yeah, he probably called her Andy or something accidentally. And they apparently yeah. did a read through <laughs> the whole script that he was in, and he's approved of it. He was going to film, then they canceled it, and apparently they're going to do rewrites. I was like, oh, jeez, you're pulling. So like he was intent. It's like he's being pulled out of the script in a rewrite already. This is like um, I don't know if you guys have heard, but Black Panther Two is apparently like on its sixth script or something. <laughs> so, I am not surprised in the fucking slightest. No, nope. like, what? Where do you possibly go with that? But yeah, with yeah. this, it's like this is a movie you've made. He's dead. Yeah, <laughs> you've, you've waited twenty years to make the next Matrix movie. You couldn't just like shift it back a month or two to accommodate yeah. Hugo Weaving. Like if if he's really that important, I'm sure you could make it work. Well, yeah, from what it sounds like, is they said do it here, and he said I'd need a bit more time. Then they said no. He's like, oh, wow, it's <laughs> too it's too long. Like all this stuff, you yeah. know. Well, fucking, dude, coming he's back 60. twenty years later, like, what the hell can you possibly do with this franchise now? Like, where can you take the story that will be like really cool and interesting? It's an, an allegory for know. trans people, for goodness' sake! It would sure suck if the movie got delayed because of lockdowns. Uh. <laughs> I, I don't understand the drop in the weaving because nobody gave a fuck about like Neo versus the machines. Everybody fucking cared about Neo versus Agent Smith. Like hmm. everybody cared about that. Nobody what gave a fuck about the machines. We cared about the yeah. rape people in the fucking tunnels. We wanted to be in the Matrix, seeing people jump around doing superpowers. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> well, yeah if you look at the, the where, where'd you videos. go though with Agent Smith? I mean, he turned in, the whole fucking world into himself. And then he got blown up and deleted. But the thing is, you can always bring him back. You can bring yeah. him back. So. No, no one's Randerson. really gone. No one's they ran a the system truth, yeah. restore and brought me back. Like, well, this is kind of I, it's so naive to even think. But we were talking earlier about like, oh, they even tell their own story. You know, tr- uh, Blazer Trail, as Robert was saying, and it's like, obviously not. They're going to be taking stuff from the original trilogy, mainly the first film, and yeah. showing it to you. Like, look, I, remember this. Look, look at this. Well, we've already got the White Rabbit doing the repeat. Why didn't yeah, they yeah. just call it Matrix? And the Reboot? black cat. 
Make yeah, the black black hair, you've got the yeah, sparring session with with um, Slimline Morpheus. You know, <laughs> the, you know the, the, all the stuff that you've seen before. And I don't know, like I wanted to give it the benefit of the doubt in the trailer and say this is all misdirection. Like they're trying to make you think it's just a lazy like rehash of the original, but actually it's some crazy new thing and it's going to like do a, a you know a switcheroo on you at some point. I just don't know if it will. I don't know if it really is just a lazy rehash. One of the Wachowskis, and we didn't want to like accommodate Hugo Weaving, and yeah, it's looking pretty. Yeah, but, if you if you're gonna pander and you don't accommodate Agent Smith, I'm very confused. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like twenty years later, and they've sort of went, "Hey, do you want to like do the exact same thing again?" Shit. Yeah. How much? Great, great science fiction's allegorical, and and what I find perhaps frustrating is that the matrix sequels whether you like them or not came out in 2003 and we're now in 2021 and in terms of how we've been impacted by the internet and the the cyber universe and all of that you know a great matrix sequel there's a lot of ground to cover there's a lot of interesting stuff they can do and from the trailer I, I was disappointed in that there's nothing new in it. There was yeah. nothing, there's nothing like bullet time. There's no effects that make you go, wow, that's, there was no ideas in that trailer. I know it's just a trailer, but that remember trailer. Remember the mirror? Did, the mirror, the, they walk through the mirror. Remember the mirror? Oh, dude, we've seen that before. <laughs> you know, no, and I'm weird. like, I just wanted something. I wanted something that, that the same way that our world today has been, rightly or wrongly expanded by the world wide web the matrix which is really a commentary on that it, the trailer offered nothing new there was yeah. nothing there that there was not one moment going i i did I, my breath did not catch in my throat went, oh, i've got to see that like when i saw bullet time man i, I was like wow and uh yeah. i have to tell you the first time i saw the matrix everybody was like um well there was johnny mnemonic that uh, a cyber thriller that Keanu Reeves was in, it was not good. It was directed by Robert Longo, who was a very famous New York visual artist. So no one was waiting for The Matrix. And when I went and saw it, I went and saw it on the Warner Brothers lot a couple of weeks before it opened. And everyone in line was wantonly making fun of this movie. Like they were like, Johnny Nematu, why are we even here? No one knew why they were. And we all went into the theater not knowing anything about it. There was no buzz on the internet by pre-screenings, corporate shills, as they say. And we all watched that film. And I have to say, I was knocked out by it. I was blown away by it. I'm like, I'm like, this is like, this movie's the shit. Because no one knew anything about it. I, I think that's, yeah, everyone kind of was. And I think that's the interesting thing about the first movie is yes. that it made that great impression of like, holy shit, like this virtual world where people have got like superhuman powers. You've got bullet time. You've got that cool um, like rotating freeze frame when Trinity is doing a fly kick against the, the cop right at the beginning. All that mm. stuff is awesome. Well, but that's a one shot right. deal. That makes a great impact one shit. time. Well, I would like to simp a little bit for the writing as well. It's, it wasn't just the effects. Yes. It's no, you're, no. The film opens up with um, all the police uh, surrounding Trinity and the, the, the cops are outside and the agents arrive and they're like, you weren't supposed to go in. And the police mm. are like, oh yeah, jurisdiction, my ass, whatever. And then the agent is like, no, for your protection. And like as an audience, you're like, what? Uh -huh. what yeah, when Smith like, says, like, your men are already dead. Yeah, he's yeah. like, and... Uh, yeah units they're bringing it down he's like no lieutenant your men are already dead yeah yep. <laughs> that's a great oh, leaving impression so yeah that was that, that is very good was so good and it was so like kick-ass and superhero and anime it's yeah I, like we were all uh, i saw bound before that so i was mm -hmm. kind of looking forward to it because i saw hey this wakowski brothers they're pretty good that did the lesbo movie that actually ended up being a pretty damn good like gangster movie you know yeah. so uh yeah i was kind of looking forward to it i didn't think it'd be that fucking good though i walked out of it going that's star wars that's it that's the next star wars that you know we've got our new you know franchise and yeah that didn't work yeah out. but, but then you know, yeah like i said like you, you had that great impression that the first movie made because it was so different and it had so unique you know filmmaking techniques in it and great writing as well but then when you come to the second and third movies that that 
you know has already been done and you don't yeah. get that same impact the second time around because you're expecting it they talk mm. about that on the special feed uh, i don't know on the they did a big special feature thing where they were critical of the movie within uh it was a dvd box set uh and they had some psychologists come in and they were talking about like what went wrong with the sequels and they admit it they're like you know what it, when we did the first movie we had a budget we were all on the we were all on the set together we were in this one studio together like eating off the same table then for the sequels all the millions rolled in we all had our own trailers catering and it and it fucked with the creativity and uh, that's uh, the, the, first, the first Matrix had a massive cultural impact as well. Yeah, like even 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 at we silly things like that fucking phone that came out the envelope, everybody wanted that fucking phone, yeah. <laughs> right? And like even something yeah. as silly as that, like it did have a huge like cultural impact. But then the the second and third movies, I even think by the time the third movie rolls around, no one give, no one gave a shit. You know the whole one Death Star, one huge Death Star that kills five planets, and then ten thousand Death Stars. It's the, they kind of do the same thing in the original <laughs> Matrix trilogy. I know. Um, you have the first agent that we see. If, if you remember, Trinity beats up all those police really easily. Yeah. We're like, yeah. whoa, this woman is not to be messed with. When she's being chased, all the police eventually can't keep up. They're even surprised. They're like, how is the agent and Trinity jumping across these rooftops? What the fuck? And then she jumps through a window. She like forward rolls and she pulls out two pistols and she's just shaking while staring at the window. And we're already like, "But you're so powerful! Like, why? What are you scared of?" And it's like, she, does she get? Like, doesn't she say something like, "Get up, Trinity"? Get up. Yeah. So we, it's very clear <laughs> from the get-go, agents are not to be fucked with. Then you have mm. um, Morpheus is the granddaddy Matrix guy. He's teaching Neo to do everything, and it's really hard to beat him. He gets beaten easily by an agent when they first fight. And yes. then when Neo first decides, I'm not going to run from the agent, it's this huge moment, like, oh my god, you're not fleeing when that's been set as, like, the rule. You always run from agents. Yeah. Go to Matrix 2 and 3, and he's fighting millions of them. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And they all look fake as fuck. That's the, yeah, that's the thing when you see the CGI. Rubber. Yeah, and it just, it, it absolutely dilutes the threat that Smith poses. Yeah. And I think that's why they realized with the third one, it's like we need to have one like Uber Smith that's going to fight him just one on one. And that's why they have him like take over the Oracle. It's like, ah, oh, this is the really powerful Smith that's the leader of all the clones. Yeah, but that, that, I thought that bit of the ND3 was absolutely retarded, though. <laughs> like, where, like, <laughs> Agent, Agent Smith's pure going, like, I could have all 7.5 billion of me coming. <laughs> like, like, and where I would be assured victory a million times over. But, you know, instead, I'm just going to do the worst possible fucking thing. Like, that was dumb. I yeah. hated they that. Like, they did, like, slow-mo punches where Agent Space is like, oh, make it oh when his face goes yeah. all fucked up and rubbery. Yeah. Like, how to, how to, like, turn a character in a com into a comedy. Do, do you know there was an absolute fucking fever dream of a Matrix game that got released for the GameCube and the final boss is a giant Agent Smith made out of Agent Smiths? <laughs> it better. It better. <laughs> is it <true>? I'm not <laughs> joking. It, it's, it's, a, it's a real that, game. That, that's Path of Deer, right? Do you remember the, the little video that plays before you fight that boss with the Wachowskis? They basically yeah. tell you as the audience, we can't think of a fun ending for a video game that would be on theme so you can fight a giant Agent Smith. <laughs> like, go nuts. Like, it doesn't wow, make yes. any sense, but fuck it. <laughs> right. at, le at least they went, yeah, fuck it, whatever. They'll just, just, just fight this giant Agent Smith. But like, you fought ants in the game, and it's like, is this a fucking Matrix game? Why am I fighting like humanoid ants? <laughs> like, you know, oh, it's fucking weird. I I think the Matrix actually the the trilogy is a a roadmap to not uh, to what not to do, in the sense that the original Matrix is all about freeing our minds, like all of us. We're all trapped in a simulation or whatever. <laughs> Neo is the person that gets freed, and yet. You think that the if they're going to make sequels, it's all about what what does a messiah now have to do to free everyone? Now, of course, that might not lend itself to action adventure, but so now that Neo is freed, how does he free everyone else in the Matrix? But the sequels don't even they don't even care about the people that are locked away in these batteries that are powering the machine world, and and it's like the regular person that Neo is one of those doesn't matter anymore 
and it's I, way more I, about the Agent Smith and the machines. That's it. And I, I thought, that, well, what about all the what about all the poor human beings yeah. that are locked away? And I thought, well, if you want to do a messianic story, how does Neo once he is freed, once you free your mind, Quaid, free Quaid. your mind. <laughs> once your mind is freed. Well, then what the hell are you going to do? How do you free a population that has been indoctrinated to believe something? I mean, my God, uh, our, our own real world talks about being red-pilled all day long, which is all about freeing our own minds. And yet the, the, the very series that started that has no interest in how to free the rest of the population. The, the human beings that are trapped in those battery pods become... Well, Cypher wanted to go back in. I mean, yeah. Cypher wanted to go back in. His deal was to make me forget this shitty ass world. Give me a steak, really. I want to eat. Yeah, I, I want to eat steak. I, I want to, you know, I want to feel as if I got some sort of existence and meaning. But out here, I'm. It's nothing. I mean, that, that was the great thing that the that first Matrix movie did was like it presented these different philosophical ideas. You know, him who who's very much just ignorance is bliss. Is his philosophy? You know, yeah. I don't mind having my wine wiped. I don't mind not knowing the true nature of what I am. If as long as I get to live in comfort and I don't have to put up with this fucking horrifying reality of what the, the world actually is. Yeah. Yep. You that, know, that, again, that, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <it's> <laughs> I just, yeah. I, I don't know. I love how it's like deep meta concepts like that, and then there's just other parts where the Merovingian goes, "Watch me make this woman come with a cake." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but she is Monica Bellucci, so it's all okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, Even him, you know, he, he's got an interesting point where he's he's just like he's all about just indulgence and and you yeah. know you know enjoying the fruits of of the finer the finer things in life because he doesn't have even a stake in this conflict he doesn't particularly care they're like programs as well right like the merovingian is a program or something like yes. that and yeah. the, his two bodyguards the dreadlock white ghost people they're like old matrix designs or something he says like they're old things and they just come through they there were so many crazy things going on in the second and third ones yeah, they tried to explain how werewolves and vampires came around. Apparently, that was programs that went rogue. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're yeah, rogue, yeah. It's like, ah, come on, Wachowskis, you're, like you're that, going yeah. a bit far with this shit now. <laughs> he, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I mean, I love the, the conversation with the architect when you get to that point. Like, I love it, too. Just, it's peak, like, Wachowski pretentious dialogue, but, like, it's great to listen to because they, it's performed by great actors. Yeah, they wrote the speech and then they took every word and put it into a thesaurus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You know that was originally written for Sean Connery. He turned down that role. And oh like, could God. you imagine what that could have been if Sean was delivering <laughs> oh, it? No, God. no, Neil, you will never learn my seven secret herbs and spices. <laughs> she, she chose to enter the Matrix at the cost oh, of her own life. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you guys remember the Scary Movie 3 parody version with, um, fuck, why am I forgetting his name? The comedian. Uh, Car Carlin. Carlin, yeah, George Carlin. George Carlin, oh. yeah, where he's got like a vibrating chair movie. and he calls it Linda. <laughs> yeah. What about the MTV Movie Awards one with uh, Will Ferrell? That one's pretty good, too. Yeah, we just start yelling out like, concordantly, yes. ergo. <laughs> ergo. <laughs> I'll be right back, guys. Hi. You notice that uh, most of those conversations started with a question being asked, and then the immediate answer would be, "Is that's not the question that you should be asking. You should be asking if you should have asked a question in the first... And he's just like, oh, well, fucking hell, okay, weirdos. Yeah. <laughs> it just gets, it gets a bit very odd. I, I just wish, uh, I don't know. I, I, I wish it had been one of us that had been Neo in that scene. It'd be like, what the fuck are you even trying to say to me here? Just like put it in plain English, dude. <laughs> I just want no, that cake. No such thing. I just want the cum cake. That's all the I want. The cum cake, yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, who wouldn't, really? Like, it's got all the good things in life. Cake and orgasm. Cake and orgasm. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask as well, like, you know... We, we talked a little bit about Indiana Jones there. Like, obviously, there's Indy 5 that's happening. That is a thing that's, for some reason, is I, getting made. Why? Was on, um, a real BBC the other, the other week where we were like, I was like, wait a minute. 
Crystal Kingdom Crystal Stupids. So that came out what, like ten years ago? Nearly coming up to ten. It's like, and he was already 13, way thirteen years ago. Thirteen. He was already way too old in that film. Like, what the yeah. fuck? Yeah. I I do not want to see an eighty-year-old man hobbling about on his arthritic old knees, trying to trying to like <clears throat> run and punch and swing from things. It's like, no, you're you're too old for that stuff now. Stop it. I actually, well, I, actually got, I actually got to walk about that set a little bit, which was pretty cool. Well, the new was one. It, yeah, it, the indie movie they filmed in Glasgow. I, 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 did you post something on Twitter about that when they were filming? I, the brass band that was like a scene where they were uh, celebrating astronauts coming back or something like that. That was what, mm. I, well, at least that's what a scene that they were filming on set, and they, they had a brass band like all dressed as sailors. Who were part of the obviously part of the scene, and they were like standing just at the side of the street and just started uh, playing the Star Wars theme tune, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, which I thought was quite funny. And everyone was like crowding around, and it's funny because I'm trying to film, and just like they're playing like this one, you know, wonderful fucking thing, and there's just a shirtless junkie walk wandering around them. <laughs> Aye, that's Glasgow for you. <laughs> Aye, Glasgow. But then, but then, like I think like the next week they were filming the Flash. And uh, we, I got to see the bat cycle. Got to see Ooh. that getting driven up the street in Glasgow. I, that was pretty cool. See, this, this is the weird thing about Glasgow because it's, it's, it's built as like a grid, isn't it? It's like a, an American city. It's all blocks, yeah. and and so you can have it fill in for other places. Like I think in World War Z, they had it fill in for like um, Philadelphia George. or somewhere like that. Yeah, they filmed that just off a of George Square. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's 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 a weird choice. I don't know if they get some kind of discount for filming in Scotland or something like that because it feels huge, like it'd be a pain huge in the tax ass. breaks, huge right. tax breaks, and that's why they also used um, oh, they used it in the Batman movie, and it was supposed to be uh, Gotham Gotham Orphanage, right? What's it called? It was the old insane asylum, the one that's uh, near Shots, or oh, what's it called again? Uh. Fuck, did, was it like a prison or something for like? A it, 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 it literally used to be an, an insane asylum. Is it called Ibrox? No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, problem is they let the inmates go out of that place at the end of the game. Uh, uh, what's it called? Oh, I forget. <laughs> I forget what it's called. But that, but that was another place that they filmed. Because I mean, they also filmed like one of the Fast and uh, Fast and Furious movies as well in Glasgow. Aye, uh, well, they filmed one in Edinburgh as well. Yeah, I they filmed uh, the fucking they filmed fucking that scene for Avengers in Edinburgh. I know. <laughs> I'll never forget the bit where it's like uh, Scarlet Witch is stood next to a shop and it says like there's a little sign beside her saying "We'll deep fry your kebab." Because <laughs> <laughs> they fucking will. <laughs> is it Gartlock Hospital? No, what? Uh, hold on, Hartwood. Gart Hartwood is called ah, Hartwood. That's it. That's what it's called. I. They. Uh, it wasn't. The thing is, I, I was hearing awful people like when I heard they were filming at Hartwood, I was like, right, they're blatantly going to make that Arkham Asylum, blatantly because it, it did used to be an asylum and it's a big, imposing, quite scary looking Victorian building. But everyone was saying that no, it was supposed to be Gotham Orphanage, and that's mm. what they were filming. But I was okay. I, I, apparently, that's what it was, but. I mean, they should have made the build an build an Arkham Asylum because it fucking looks like Arkham Asylum. We've got a lot of scary old Victorian buildings in in Scotland, Aye. so like they're perfect for all that kind of thing. Uh, Is there a defining Scottish film? You know, people say like something like uh, "With Nail and I" funny. is the quintessential British drinking movie. Probably train spotting is like your defining Scottish movie. Which I love. If you wanted the culture of Scotland in the mid nineties, it would be in that. And by the way, I think Train Spotting Two is one of the great unsung sequels of all time. I did no, enjoy it. I, I did actually enjoy Train Spotting Two. I thought, you know, the same thing we're talking about with the Matrix. Oh, here's a here's a sequel twenty years later. Oh, this is going to yep. be shit. But then I watched Train Spotting Two, and I was genuinely surprised. I actually really enjoyed it. I agree with you. I think it's 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 so unsung, and you know, in America, it bombed. I I went opening day. I was so excited about it. I thought, my God, Train Spotting was was to me one of the quintessential films of the '90s. Uh, it was a breakthrough film. The music in, I mean, what a soundtrack! Danny Boyle, 
uh, putting his imprintur on on pop culture. And I went and saw Trainspotting too, and there was nobody there. And I'm like, how could you? What? And it didn't do well in this country. But let me tell you, I did buy the 4K Blu-ray disc. Yeah. Yes, I did. I, th I think there, there might have been a few jokes in there that the Americans wouldn't have got, like oh, especially, especially the bit where they went into the Orange Lodge and stole everyone's bank cards because they knew all the pin numbers would be sixteen ninety. And I know, <laughs> that, I know that, <laughs> and I know that Americans would be like, "What? I don't no. get it." But everyone in Scotland was going, "Ha ha ha, fucking Huns!" <laughs> <laughs> you know that was a film though that where you, where you had a, a writer director who really understood the material. And 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 I thought that was a zeitgeist film. I thought it would really catch on here in America. And, and it was, if you're going to see a sequel 20 years after the fact, that to me is the quintessential sequel that everyone should look at and be like, okay. I, I, I honestly don't know how anyone in America even connected with Train Spotting because it's so. It's so uniquely Scottish, like it's so um, like all the 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 references and stuff, like the culture and everything. It's it's just complete Edinburgh in the nineties, and I just like I imagine like Americans just looking at that, like thinking, "What the fuck is this?" It's a lot of see how a lot of places like America and England and everything like that. They try and not include too many like esoteric cultural things, so that the movies can like appeal to a much wider audience. Like a lot of like Scottish content is written just for Scottish people. Like for example, Still Game is not big outside of <laughs> Scotland, right? Rab yeah. Rab Rab Scene is, but literally doesn't even get played anywhere else in the world because nobody can understand what the fuck he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tried to show it to my American friends. No one had any idea what he was saying, and I was getting annoyed at having to like translate it. And I'm like, he's speaking clear English, but you know, he's not. Yeah. He's not. At all. But you know, though, I I would say, look, I I love Train Spotting. I was knocked out by it, and the opening, the opening, the Renton when he's saying "Choose Life," you know, and he gives his whole monologue. I think we all kind of got that the consumerist culture and all that. And while the various very scottish elements of 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 the story don't resonate with us but i think it still works i i mean i i love train spotting I, i've probably seen it you know 50 times and yet i don't i've never gone train spotting even the title i'm like wait what and yet that film does resonate with me and and when i saw the when, when i saw T2, I thought they really did a phenomenal job of bringing back those characters and making them resonate. It was like, my God, where are these people going to be 20 years later? And they did a phenomenal job. And I keep waiting. That's why I don't want to equate necessarily Train Spotting 2 with The Force Awakens. <gasps> but I thought Train Spotting 2 did a much better job of showing us a progression. Uh, of decades in that universe, in our universe, than The Force Awakens did. And I, I'm like, how did Danny Boyle make a better Star Wars sequel than the people that were hired to make Star Wars? Because Danny Boyle is actually intelligent. Uh, there you <laughs> go. <laughs> I just, well, I just noticed, it. Dank, by the way, I, fucking, I was looking at your icon there and I was like, what the fuck is that? And it's like, I was, it's Humza coming <laughs> off his scooter <laughs> Humza <laughs> Yusuf, I've I've been I've been enjoying it so much, man, because he has been crying about it on Twitter all fucking day, and I've just I've just been laughing at him, but he's got me fucking muted. <laughs> man, I'm just I don't know why I, the video only came out today. I've watched it like fifty times. It's, it's, it's the like, bit where you do the Grand Theft Auto, like you're dead, yeah, or wasted yeah, or whatever on it, and it's, it goes into slow motion. It's just. And I'll admit, like I am, I am not a shadow fraud to, like type of guy, but fuck him, <laughs> fuck him, man. <laughs> he brought it on himself. Why the fuck was he racing on that thing in the first place? Man? He's, he's got plastic wheels on a linoleum floor, and he's yeah, racing well. up the fucking corridor. Of course, he's going to eat shit. <laughs> <laughs> Why is That's he on a beautiful in the first place? He to he tore his Achilles playing badminton. That's how much of a pussy he is. <laughs> that's a that's a proper like upper, upper middle class thing to do. I think Az is just watching the video now. 
Yeah. <laughs> Wait, as Link, I want to see this thing. Yeah, well, as, I mean, I are you able to share cool it, mate? And yeah, 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 yeah I can. I can. I can uh, hold on, I can share this. This. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I think. I think chat deserves to see this. Like, it's beautiful. Okay. Um, let's share awesome. with audio. Scottish Health Secretary furious after BBC journalists post him falling off scooter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if we can get this. <laughs> Here he goes. Oh, I've got to get to this meeting. I'm so important. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Why was, that was he doing a three wheeled scooter? Come on, man. Um, well, the, th the, theory, the theory is he was running extremely fast because there was a white Four man wheels. behind him. Four wheels. <laughs> 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 Oh, there was another. There was a thing that he was bitching about it all day. Like, see, see if you fall and the video gets posted, you fucking laugh, right? You laugh and you own the joke and have him because it's funny. Yeah. But he was on Twitter like bitching about it and being a little pussy about it and all. And then people dug up, you know, offense archaeology. People dug up an old tweet of him laughing at a Tory guy who was in a wheelchair because of an injury he had falling out of his wheelchair. <laughs> yeah, so basically he get called out for doing the exact same thing. Wow. But it's just I uh, Hamza Yusuf is a it's just a fucking idiot, man. I have no idea why he's in his job. Yeah. Mm. Um, That's well, our health secretary. Yeah. That's our health secretary, a man who tore his Achilles playing fucking badminton. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say as well when we were obviously we were talking a little bit about Indiana Jones there. Um, how do you feel about him getting replaced by um, Phoebe Waller Bridge? Oh, super excited! Fun? Very, very much engaged with that. I'll be watching all of her takes on it. I don't really want to see uh, uh, him anymore. He's too old. But a young woman? Hell yeah, let's do it. I, I definitely want to see this gangly, goofy, awkward English actress being a kick-ass adventurer. Yeah, He's going to travel guys, the did, you, did you know women can raid temples too? <laughs> yeah. Do you, you guys know as well? This actress is incredible. She was the voice of L337 in uh, Solo, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. I fully understand. That's one of you guys' favorite characters from mm. Everyone loved her. I, I, the, because I, she's known in the UK as more of a writer, isn't she? She wrote Fleabag and she wrote yeah. um, Killing Eve. Um, both of which were a little bit insufferable for me. Like I just, I could never get into them really. Um, and so the idea that she's going to be playing this new and improved Indiana Jones, it just fucking makes me want to vomit from my eyes. It's disgusting. I, I don't know. I, I'm assuming this is a prank. This is some troll or whatever. There's no way they're actually going to have her try and replace Harrison Ford. How are you going to follow up Harrison Ford? I mean, for fuck's sake, like you can't, you can't outdo that guy. You're never going to equal what he's done. Well, I've had to wait for him to get to eighty before they try. So <laughs> it's just like, why? Why did you just let Kathleen Kennedy make this movie? Just, just shuffle her out the door and let someone who actually, you know, cares about the franchise do it. I, have, I haven't even looked into this. You guys will know the answers. What's the what's Spielberg and Lucas's involvement with this? None. 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 Steve None. Spielberg okay. is like an executive, senior vice president, producer, or something like a meaningless and title. I yeah. have to say that what I what I'm curious about is. Like I'm a fan of James Mangold. I, I've I've liked a lot of his work. I mean, last he did Ford v Ferrari, he did Logan. Um, I thought he was a good replacement for this. And you know, Clint Eastwood has Cry Macho coming out. He's a 91 year old writer director and star. Well, he, he's actually he wrote. He actually didn't write it. He directed and starred in Cry Macho at 91. So I don't have a problem with our aging stars. I mean, I wanted to see the Unforgiven of the Indiana Jones franchise. I'm all for that. So what I don't understand is because was Harrison Ford injured, so they're pivoting? Are they turning Indiana Jones 5 into the Phoebe Waller-Bridge show? Or are they giving us the Indiana Jones 5 that was written that Mangold was directing that they now can't give us? It, it, it is I, I don't understand... Uh, the whole story. What's going on here? I swear uh, to God, if, they, if he hands the hat over to her by the end, I swear to God. <laughs> There'll be an unbridled rage of epic proportions. It's well, ridiculous. Why do it? 
I mean, why have they done so many of the things they've already done? I mean, uh, I would have thought this was ridiculous, but now it's absolutely believable in the time we're in. Uh, I, I, and there's no explanation. They just, I, the only one I could buy is they need content. They need stuff. They need to justify Lucasfilm's existence outside of Star Wars. Maybe I have no idea. Kathleen Kennedy needs to insert herself into another franchise as a British woman. Who knows? I mean, she's done it in Star Wars. Why not do it in, uh, in Indiana Jones? It's, uh, I, I, yeah, I'd love to ask James Mangold, but I'm blocked on but Twitter. The, to be fair, though, she was involved in the original uh, indie films. I mean, Frank Marshall, her husband, was in Raiders. He was the yeah. the Nazi uh, uh, soldier that gets clocked in the head on the on the flying wing. Oh, her it's, husband played a Nazi. Cancel him now. <laughs> I know, right? But but that, that's the thing. I mean, I wonder. I I. I I'm I, I I would love this is why Star Trek Picard is so frustrating to me because the idea I, I read this book by one of my favorite modern writers Dan Simmons who um, many people don't know but if you watch the TV series The Terror that was based on one of his books and okay. he wrote a book called Phases of Gravity and it was about an astronaut who landed on the moon and now 30 years on, he's a bad father. And the the story was like, what, what happens when you're a man who is still vibrant and has a lot to offer, but the best thing you've ever done that you ever will do happened 30 years ago? How do you, how do you remain relevant? And to me, uh, and, and this character still stayed a strong, vibrant, virile man who who was questioning his life, but it was a great story. And I thought Star Trek Picard, you know, he was portrayed as an archaeologist. I would have thought that wouldn't it have been interesting if we saw Picard in his later days doing what he loved? You know, he's on some far flung world. Uh, discovering the, the the some kind of uh, new, uh, making a great discovery and doing what he loved to do, and yet he was called back to service, and and it would have been something where he was as a character revered, and yet we're given a show where a character like Picard was denigrated from the opening scenes. He was he was portrayed as a doddering old man who cowered away from the universe. Locked away in a in a uh, in a house that he hated. We we knew from Next Generation he hated being there. He hated being there with his brother. Why would he ever go back there? Why would they make that? Because apparently they only watched Family and a few other episodes. Why do that? Why make that? Why why not? Why not turn old age into something that can be fucking kick ass? Why yeah. do we have to like yeah, denigrate man. our character, man? Hey, uh, and, and, and Clint Eastwood hasn't fucking given up the ghost. At 91, he's making a movie called Cry Macho. And yet we get a Picard show where they fucking kill him in the end and turn him into a goddamn robot like Ash. After he apologizes. This, is, this has always been the Picard apology tour, isn't it? I mm. The, the, the writing is so weak in this that they can't even understand what it is that he's supposed to be apologizing for. No, you know, they, I, I already they launched like, a flotilla of thousands of ships to save the Romulan like, population from a supernova. Uh, I, you know, but they, they got sabotaged and blown up and we couldn't get any more ships, so not everyone got out in time. Oh, I'm so sorry. What the fuck are you sorry for? What else could you have possibly done in the position you were in? It's, it's, gotten, it's, like, it's just more ridiculous. You literally why is Starfleet did everything incompetent? Was... <clears throat> why is everyone stupid and dumb? Because well, this... Starfleet because... said, no, we're not going to help. Picard grabbed an armada or as big an armada as he possibly could to help us get as many out as possible. And they blamed him. It's like this is the most fucking retarded thing I've ever heard. This This is a classic example of like when you're writing, you're trying to make a bunch of different pieces fit together that don't because you're too stupid to create the correct pieces in the first place. Yeah. And, and this is what you end up with. They just watched YouTube highlights of Star Trek. So that's their knowledge of it. I don't even think they watch full episodes. And, and nothing makes sense in that series. And yes, the review is still coming. But uh, uh, what I mean, Soji or whatever her name is at the end. She's ready to wipe out all organic life in the 
back in Galaxy, and then she changes her mind last minute, and they're like, "Come on the ship with us, and let's go travel around." <laughs> so she could still, she still got the phone number for the evil tentacles that were coming out of the space butthole to, to destroy everything. <laughs> Uh, it would just here. You, 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 can, you can bunk so with the uh, you can bunk with the murderer yeah. who we haven't handed in, or yeah. you can bunk with the, the the fresh lesbians that have just decided they they want to rub fucking Chinese. I mean, p choose your choose your person. Pick your just poison. nuts. Absolutely uh, nuts. I've uh, it's been made aware to me that uh, Mister. Mr. Heel versus Babyface, you've you've kind of run out of time, man. Um, yeah, I've got I got to head out, dude. Sorry. No, no, I, I understand, man, and I appreciate you joining us for this stream. It's much much appreciated, dudes, and I'm sure everyone in chat would echo that. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you for having me again. Appreciate the, that. The, the link to as his channel. To stream with you, sir. Mm. <laughs> yeah. My Picard, my Picard shipping notice came in last night too. So, showing. Sh well, uh, mine's two weeks ago and it's, no, it's not here, yeah, so I well, don't know. I know. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us, Drinker. It's been great. Thank you all uh, for uh, for being here, guys, as well. And chat, thank you so much indeed, and I shall see you all soon. Bye, as Bye, Missy. Sure. Thank you very much. And for everyone watching in chat, the links to Azzy's channel is in the, the description, so please give him a subscribe if you haven't already, because he Produces great stuff and produces great rants. I love listening to them. <laughs> I'm going to produce a great snore soon as well. Yeah. <laughs> See you later, guys. Cheers, Cheers. buddy. All righty. Uh, yeah, what the hell were we talking about there that sparked all of this? Oh, yeah, we were. Now we could we do were some on. real talk. Yeah, now that Az is out of the picture. <laughs> God damn. God, he's gone. <laughs> thought he'd never leave. <laughs> uh, you don't no, have to listen to any more of his disgusting babble. We're, we're talking about like 90 year old men being brought back to their characters because uh, Hollywood is so creatively bankrupt and afraid of new ideas and new things that the, all they have is bringing back old guys so they can apologize, gender and race swapping, everything else. Uh, I mean, uh, d distorting Norse mythology beyond belief uh, when there's like other mythologies out there. They actually exist. If you look into, I mean, crack open a book once in a while. Uh, every country has them. Matt, I couldn't agree more. You know, uh, Gary, this movie, I have to say, yes, I just got this on 4K on Steelbook. Unforgiven to me is one of the great, I mean, 1992. Yeah. One of the, one of the great films, not just westerns, but one of the great films ever made. I, I, I was knocked out by it when I saw it, but it dealt with aging and myth and legend and what does it mean when you can't live up to who you're supposed to be? And it was in 1992, put out by a major studio, and it won Best Picture. Yeah. And I would think that whenever you're going to do a story about, like if you were going to do a story about Gandalf feeling over the hill. <laughs> or something unforgiven would be the template that would that's what you would look to what Dude, i that movie is top notch my favorite western of all time oh and my it's, god i mean it's what a I meta love, film as well absolutely it's meta it's, and it's and i you brits would understand this when richard harris is like no one would assassinate a queen you know yeah, he talks yeah. about why would you assassinate a president come on now it, it, it's a great it's a great allegory for you know the pretentiousness of of the, the the myth of the old west that was getting constructed even as it was dying out as a culture so good that's how you do deconstruction that movie is one of the best examples where they, yes. they start to look inward on everything they've achieved it's almost like commentary on clint eastwood's career as a gunslinger that movie it is so goddamn good every character has such interesting things to say on gunslinging and that movie is offering a completely different perspective where we see all these badasses like spinning their guns shooting everybody with ease these guys are like most people just miss, and if that's I, if they're shooting, they're just panicking. Gene Hackman gives like, a great monologue about all that when he's yep. when he's got like um, you know English Bob in the prison cell, mm. and he's talking to that biographer guy, and he's like, you know, the, this great like um, duel that English Bob described, it was actually just a drunken brawl yep. in a saloon, and like both of the guys were so fucking drunk they couldn't even aim at each other properly, and but one guy, up. his weapon exploded in his hand, and then English Bob had to like put his gun right up against his head and shoot him. Just brilliant stuff. Great dialogue from great actors. 
You know, and, and David Peoples, who wrote the script, was one of the uh, screenwriters of Blade Runner. Yep. You know, and 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 it, it, what I don't understand is like if I was going to make a Picard show, I would have I would have looked to Unforgiven as as something. Not that what's interesting is that you don't. He wasn't a fighter, but you do the reverse. You you flip it on it. You you flip the script. And what I don't understand about Picard was you made this man a doddering old fool who had nothing to say and no agency and and the idea i mean god love patrick stewart but i'm sure a lot of this was his idea but it isn't great storytelling and what i don't understand is how come people don't know this it was um, funny you're referencing this too because compared with Unforgiven, right? You've got he he can't get up his horse for most of the film. He slips, he falls, he gets covered in mud. People don't take him seriously. But there's this character underneath all of that that he doesn't want to come to the surface. He's almost afraid of being mm -hmm. that. Person. And we're mm -hmm. all just in there like, who who is what? Like like you know, it's fine. And I don't know if you guys remember. It's I love this movie. I watched it relatively recently again. It's just so fucking good. He spent a lot of the film denying drinks, not having drinks. The drinks are almost like connected to his past. He doesn't drink anymore. The second he finds out Ned is being, being killed, Dude. he grabs the bottle and starts drinking. Yeah. That's one because. of my favorite moments in Hollywood history because he has the bottle when she says, Ned's in front of Greeley's. And he can't deal with it. And then he hoists the bottle up. Yep. And he takes his first drink in 10 years. And you're like, all hell is going to break mm -hmm. loose. And, yeah. and, and these are, why isn't Star Trek creating, I mean, we don't have to deal with them exactly the same way, but a Picard series should make, there should be a moment, like you just said, Mahler, where Picard has some moment, I don't, he doesn't need to swig a bottle. No. <laughs> but there needs to be a moment where, where this is when Picard comes back. And and they they gave us they gave us the Picard you know pig farming and all that, but they never gave us the moment where he became Jean Luc fucking Picard again. We because didn't get you're that. not allowed it. You yeah, can't you have that now. You're not allowed to have yeah. these characters become intimidating and powerful again. It's the same reason fucking Luke Skywalker was never allowed to be, be a genuine powerful character anymore. You know, until the, the last episode of The Mandalorian. Exactly, yeah. And it had to be like snuck under the radar almost yeah. to make it happen. And no it's one the, even knew what was happening when they were making the show. And it's the same with, with, with every franchise you want to pick. All of these characters that, that used to be these, these iconic heroes, you can by all means portray them as older men who are cynical and, and uh, world-weary by this point, um, but they can still be formidable. They can still be dangerous men in their own right, but they're not allowed to be now. They have yeah. to be broken down to their most pathetic elements. They have to be like not just uh, deconstructed; they have to be demolished. Yeah. Why? Why is fucking Hans Han Solo give up, give up after his son goes to the dark side? He just gives up and goes fucking smuggling yeah. and runs away. Uh, why not? Like, no, I'm gonna find this Snoke bitch and I'm gonna fuck him up. Like this, uh, that what that's what Han yes. would have done. And everybody would have been, yeah, you know. Why did he give up the Falcon? I mean, yeah. come on, give me a it, fucking break. He totally food. He, he didn't. Someone took it from him. Ah, it comes down to I, I hate, dude. It, it's just truth. They you can't have masculinity, and and Star Wars doesn't work without it. Marvel Comics doesn't work without it. Star Trek doesn't work without it. Now, I'm not saying like over the top fucking macho shit all the time, but uh, yeah, you need to have some people kicking fucking ass once in a while. That's why we watched that stuff in the first place. We want to see them kick. You know, we saw the, you know, uh, they blew up Alderaan. You say, I want to see your your shit blow up now. You know, that's yeah. that's that's we we want to see that stuff. It's entertainment. And that's what we like about it, because, you know, it's not stuff we experience in our life. All the time, and it's uh, it's good to see some justice served once in a while. Uh, but now it's no, all of our villains have to be understandable. We have to understand our villains, and they're really not villains. And don't use the word terrorist anymore. That's bad. And do better. That I mean, like that's that's oh, it's propaganda shit. That's it what it is. 
It was it wasn't like Han because like obviously in like the OG like Star Wars movies he gets his payment and you think he's going to just take off and bugger off but then at the final fight at the end with the Death Star he comes roaring back in and everything because he knew it was the right thing to do but then when it came to literally his own fucking son he was like eh. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. it's fucking pathetic. And the, there were people when it came out were like, "Yeah, I can picture Han abandoning his son." I remember I was like, "Okay, I go that fucking far." Like, holy shit! <laughs> because yeah. it was like, "Oh, you know, he's yeah, he's a, he's a bit of an idiot. He's a smuggler. Or he's different." It's like you could kind of see how he would fuck up family life. It's like I don't want to see him fuck up family life unless you write that really fucking well, as opposed to telling us in the future he fucked it all up. You're like, "Oh, okay." Thanks. <laughs> like you could have just not told me that. Well, this, this is this is writing that? characters for children. This is what I've said about modern movie tell movie storytelling. It's like you don't get adults anymore. You don't get proper men acting like men and talking like men. You get children inhabiting men's bodies. So they are they are impulsive. They're emotional. They're weak, they're insecure, they doubt themselves constantly, and they need constant validation, and they have to be corrected by someone who's more mature. And it's usually, you know, a diverse woman of color or whatever. And th that's what you're left with now. Like, you don't get men in, in movies anymore. You have children, because it's written by children with the minds of children. That, that's what we're reduced to at this point in our culture. Mm -hmm. I, I look at I, I always look to like foreign films because foreign films are still fucking glorious. Everything that comes out of like South Korea is fucking phenomenal. Uh, by the way, I, I agree yeah. with you, Count. I mean, did you watch Train to Busan? Oh, oh, yeah. oh, best. By the way, that's a movie best. about a father. A yes. father. I yeah. mean, it's about, from the well, very that, beginning, a father. That, what a great movie, line of dialogue seen. between between the protagonist and the, the big guy who's like the, the kind of MVP of the whole movie, where yeah. the guy just says to him, us fathers get a shit deal. We're, we're, we're trampled down and we're, we're insulted, but we're expected to just persevere. Yeah, Like, what a fucking brilliant commentary on the modern world. You yeah. would never get that from a, a, a Hollywood studio. Never. I, it's like North Koreans. I like the fact is there's so many things that they just don't do in movies now because all of Hollywood are like, oh no, we can't, we can't do that, we can't do that. But then you've got I saw the devil where they're like, oh my god, <laughs> I was just gonna say that. Oh my there's god, just like one rape scene, two Dude. rape scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I saw the devil is one of the great. If you, I, I say great, but I, I say it very like it's not for everyone. But it's no, phenomenal. No, no, it's not. Phenomenal. I mean, you know, the, the uh, Bong Joon Ho, who made Parasite, you go back and look at Memories of Murder. Oh, you know, that's great. That's a, great. a great yeah. film. And of course, they've solved the case since the movie was made. When the movie was made, they didn't know. Yeah, they caught, they caught the guy. They yeah, caught the was, guy. That was recent. That was in the last yeah, two years. Yeah, it was in the last yeah. year. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, but I think you're absolutely right, Count. Uh, Korean cinema is un. Even the host. You know, you go back and you watch a monster film that has Weta Digital doing the effects. Korea is doing some amazing, amazing work. And even on Netflix, the Korean series Kingdom, a period zombie uh, series, amazing stuff. And, you know, it, it, what's, what's amazing is to me, great storytelling is worldwide. It's yeah. universal. Yeah. It, it transcends culture. It transcends boundaries. Great storytelling is universal for a reason. And our planet has a lot more great storytelling around the world than we now in America, Hollywood, is giving the, the, the planet. Because we're in the grasp of a lot of bullshit. And, yeah. and uh, unfortunately, our storytelling that used to be great, used to be universal, used to be timeless is now grasped in the grip of crazy look i will always say your universe and your agenda must never come before your characters and story and yeah. unfortunately that's not the case here yeah so, so south korea still followed the great ethos of hey do you want to make a good movie <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, do, you want, do, you want to, do you want to not have any like weird politics or like social messaging or any of that in it? Do you want to just tell like a fucking great story? 
And they do, like, there's so many fucking bangers that have came out of fucking South Korea. Like, fucking, like, my, my top one, I've, even though I've seen shit tons of them, my, my top one will always be Old Boy. Always yeah. be oh, Old dude. Boy. That's Chat's got nuts over movie. Old Boy. It's fucking beautiful. Perfect oh, movie. Such a good movie. Well, the entire, I mean, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, Old Boy, Lady Vengeance. I love that whole trilogy. It's so good. So I haven't good. seen the other two. I've seen Old Boy because that's the one that did the rounds in the oh, West. Yeah, I've not seen the other two. Listen, yet. Count, please watch Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and Lady Vengeance. You will like them. Right. Good. They're not quite Old Boy quality, but they're still really good. What you're saying about um, keeping your, your universe and your characters almost separated and stuff is like they're teaching the opposite right now. They're like, you need to put everything about you into the product. You need to make it all, it's your feelings, your blah, blah, blah. But then also just like, but make sure it kind of fits this stuff. <laughs> like, get, get it all. And it's just like, man, you know, because like, um, you look at all the phase four stuff. Nobody's acting like they're supposed to. Everyone's uh, according to rails that have been created by whoever's uh, currently guiding the ship at Marvel and stuff. It's the same for a lot of movies. Char characters don't get to be characters. They are, um, I don't know, v like v vessels for messages. Yeah, yeah that's what they are. Critical drinker, I have to ask you, you're a novelist, you know, and and you your understanding of classical storytelling. Every time I watch one of your reviews or one of your videos, I'm like, man, that guy so understands classical storytelling, genre tropes, all of those things, and why we love them. When you start, when you create a story, when you're gonna set sit down and write a novel, what is your process? How do you begin? Do you begin with a character? Do you begin with a plot? How do you create those indelible characters? I mean, generally speaking, I start with a character. I'll start with with an idea of a character that I find really interesting that I want to explore and I want to understand how they became that person that they are. Mm. And then what would that person then do if they were put in unusual situations or whatever? And that allows you to then explore, you know, all kinds of like interesting ideas, storytelling wise. Never, ever in my writing career, like 10 years I've been doing this, never have I ever thought, what's the message I want to put forward here? No, of course not, because that's not what writers do. But well, some of them do. That's the thing, like especially now, if you're a writer in Hollywood, that's all you do, basically. Well, but, like, but what, that's what's the their... political message I want to tell people right now. Yeah, cool. Bad like, writing. Uh, Bad writing. Yeah, but yeah, like when I do it, I just want to like I I just want to create an interesting story with interesting characters that that people would find enjoyable to read. That's it. I don't care about anything beyond that. But that's that's the beginning of great storytelling. I've been railing on my own channel. I rail against the fact you cannot put your agenda or your universe or your sequel or whatever. Every single franchise began with one great movie. And no one who was involved with those great movies knew that they were going to make a second one. They had no idea. They were making great films and they, they were doing what they were doing. They, do you think that when... Uh, look... When they made when 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 uh, First Blood was made, it was based on a book, you know, and and they tr Sylvester Stallone imposed his own persona on it. They didn't know that there was going to be Rambo First Blood Part Two that James Cameron wrote. They were just making First Blood and fucking kicked ass. It's really it was, lucky they didn't go with the original ending because Rambo I, died. I in know the, the original I, one. Well, I'm sure Stallone was like, hey, you know, that we could make a sequel. Yeah. Hey, but, you know, we could do two or three of these, you know? But you look at that movie and, like, it, it, it works. I mean, it, it, it works perfectly, the, yeah. The first hour of that film is basically a perfect film. Let, let me tell you what the, the problem that we have now, right? It's that other people who were smarter and more creative and more talented created these great franchises, these great characters, whether it was First Blood, like you mentioned there, or whether it was like um, Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever. The problem is we get forward like 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. It gets handed off to a new generation of writers and they're told like, you know, you have to write this new series, this new movie or whatever. They didn't create that stuff. They didn't put in the work. They didn't have that creativity. They didn't earn anything that they fucking got. They got given this gig 
and they got no fucking appreciation for the incredible opportunity that they have and the incredible responsibility that they have to the people that are actually invested in this stuff, all that they think in their dumb fucking like ATIQ brains is, oh, this is a great chance for me to put in my political messaging. And that is their mindset. That is how they create it. They stand on the shoulders of giants and they shit all over them. And that's what's so frustrating about modern cinema. I... If, if, if they want to create their own crap, fine. If it's good, then people will watch it. If it's shit, nobody will. But they don't because they can't. What they do is they get given this stuff that other people who are far more intelligent than them have made and they destroy it. That's what, like, ultimately, people like me, people like Mahler, people like Gary find so fucking frustrating is seeing these great things that were made by other people destroyed by people who are fucking idiots. Dude, let me just bow down because that was beautiful, and you're absolutely <laughs> right. And I agree with you 100%. And I have to ask Gary. I mean, Gary, you know, you sent me a picture the other day of Galadriel, and uh, your figure of Galadriel. And I'm like, I don't think I know anyone who loves Lord of the Rings more than you. You know the material, you know the work, you love the movies. I mean, and the, and and I know people that are Tolkien purists that are like, oh, Tom Bombadil. But you understand that they have to adapt things. The Second Age, this, this new Lord of the Rings series. I mean, I spent years of my life steeped in the, the people that made the Lord of the Rings films. I'm a little terrified. Uh, of yeah. This, of this show. Should I be? Absolutely. And by the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, if you don't know, this guy asking me this question had something to do with like some of the greatest special features ever created for a film. Uh, I've watched them as much, if not more than the actual films themselves. Which, by the way, aren't on this mythical, amazing uh, collection that's coming out. They're not yeah. out our 30 hours of special features that apparently are lost to the sands of time. Oh, but thank that you is... for that, Gary. Oh, no, they are. You, if you want to know how they made a good film, watch these. You, you had passionate, talented people who, who had reverence for Tolkien and said that up front, like, hey, we don't want to put our messages in this thing. This is about putting Tolkien's messages in, and we're going to do the best, uh, the best we possibly could. And they did, and they made the greatest trilogy ever uh, to me anyway. And unfortunately, Amazon, who remember canceled a conan series that by all accounts was going to be great because it was too masculine is going to take this and try to shove and try to make it for the modern audience forgetting about like what makes things great is timeless now i i don't know uh, i'm not a writer so i don't know what uh what a drinker or robert or or mauler uh no dank i don't know if you're a writer or not i don't mean to leave you out of this but i'm not a i'm not a writer i i sold books for 10 years so i like i just know what i like uh and i i don't like hearing uh nudity possibly even being considered unless it's like guess innocent nudity which i doubt it's going to be that because uh bezos himself said he wanted a game of thrones um and in the second age there's a lot of stuff you can interpret and twist and make game of thrones which is tolkien would have never ever allowed and mm. yeah we're, and we're and we're talking about uh, an era with different values right with a lot of different values that would go against what tolkien would have originally wanted and obviously he's not alive to defend himself you can still make something good i there would have been a time i would have been excited about this uh maybe like five or six years ago if they were going to make it but now yeah knowing what we're going to get and we're going to get an intersectional feminist Lord of the Rings where Galadriel yeah. will be in armor fighting with a, an all female Numenorean fucking army, uh, taking on Sauron, you know, and who, who will probably be bisexual. The problem with that is right. As a, as in the law, Sauron was bisexual, <laughs> right? It was a, Basically, during the Second Age, he had he was in his sort of like elvish form, where he was like yep. 
this mix between man and woman, but he was like he was fine as fuck. He made himself into like <laughs> the most beautiful person like in all of Arda. And the reason that he did that is because it, it made it easier for him to manipulate people. Yep. And he would he would fuck like men and women. Like it wasn't directly written but heavily implied. Like Yeah, was he not Sauron the Fair or something? He was Oh yeah, he was he was fucking so Sauron the Bang Tidy. Oh they'll like, lean into <laughs> that. Bang <laughs> they will. Oh yeah. most Sauron the fit as fuck. Yeah, when, yeah, so but basically, see, like, so see that if that's included in it, then I'll be like, yeah, okay, like that's fine, and then everyone's gonna be like, Sauron's non-binary, yes, queen, right? Like, <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of that shit, but I'll tolerate it because that's in the law. But see, if I get any other fucking shit, like some fucking like non-binary, like neurodivergent fucking hobbits or some retarded shit like that. That's that's when I'm going to get annoyed because none of that was mentioned in the Tolkien universe. Like, did, I don't know if any of you seen that uh, timetable for like the Tolkien Society fucking discussions. Did you see that oh, shit? Oh my god! Yeah. I heard well, about it. Like, by the way, shout out to uh, 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 just some guy because man, his coverage of that was very worthwhile. Yeah, was it not things like um, queer it queerism in like Middle Earth and like tra- yeah, and you know, trans, 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 trans people trans people in Gondor yeah. or something like that? Like, oh, yeah, fuck was, off! Just, do you think do you think Tolkien actually gave a shit about any of that nonsense when Tolkien, he was writing his books? If Tolkien it, was alive today, he would have just pure went, "I wish I died in the trenches." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, look, I mean, I have to say that that I've always said that people different kinds of people that have a voice and finally get a voice to speak is a great thing. It's awesome. But don't then turn around and take other people's voices like Tolkien and appropriate them and presume to then pervert change uh, what they've done. Don't impose your voice on them. And I think that's something that's really insidious. Like, why can't people say, look, I've got my own voice. I want you to hear it. I'll be like, great. I'm great. uh, Fantastic. But don't dare presume that people like Tolkien or C.S. Lewis or any of the great Octavia Butler and the Kindred series, whatever you want to say, don't presume to speak for those people. Don't try and change what they've done. You know what? You want to have your own voice? Give me your own voice. I will listen. But do not tell me that someone else's voice has anything to do with yours. And that's yeah. what they're trying to do now. And it's it's fucking insidious. Oh. And it is something we must rail and fight against forever. Well, yeah. I think this is what you get now with these um, with these authors, you know, Tolkien or like Frank Herbert when we're talking about Dune, is like the either um, they they retroactively try and um, put words in their mouth and say, well, you know, this person was secretly pro LGBTQ plus AI, whatever, <laughs> you know, or they were a, a secret Nazi and a bigot, and they have to be completely silenced. And like, we're not going to like listen to a single thing they say. We're just going to take their work and modernize it to make it better and do better. You know, those are the two options. I think you have to take that like more pragmatic view and just say, no, like this person wouldn't have agreed with a lot of the things that I say nowadays or that, uh, that I believe, but that doesn't matter because we're going to be faithful to what they created because we're making an adaptation of their work. And we're not going to presume to lecture them about what they intended to do back then. Yeah, it's it's baffling too, because uh, all the, yeah, there's plenty of women in the lore. Uh, er, er, everything uh, is there already. You don't need to add anything modern to a timeless tale. And I think the biggest, the scariest thing with this is there's no dialogue at all. None. You know, the history. So they're going to be filling in a lot of a lot of bl- blanks. And uh, you know, uh, th- there's no hobbits. There's no wizards. Oh, yeah. uh, those those are two of the things people, the normies, go to Lord of the Rings for. Now 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 I hear there might be. They're playing it fast and loose with the second age. And oh, it's just, it sounds very bad robot to me. And as you know, the showrunners have done nothing. They have no experience. They uh, co-wrote a bad Star Trek movie. And they are they have been given the most expensive show in the history of time. Uh, and all you need to do is try to adapt uh, Tolkien as close as possible. And you will you might do okay. 
uh, or or it could be the most colossal freaking flop of all time and there'll just be a split fan base like there was for star wars and star trek and you know you asked earlier robert why do people why are people forgiving so much bad writing well it's because it's become it's sports now people are rooting for teams they're 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 simply liking something because somebody else doesn't like it and vice versa and they're getting their their self-worth wrapped up in it and not judging it as an individual piece of art Right, it's, very, and, it's, it's yeah, incredibly like being, frustrating. They like being part of events as well. Like, yeah, oh, let's all love this together. That makes it even more meaningful. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's no longer like a piece of entertainment. It's no longer a good story. It's a cultural moment. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's political messages and stuff like that. When a lot of the things, like, see if anybody tries to put in like this gender, sexuality, pronoun, fucking nonsense. When, like, do you, see, during the time that Tolkien wrote all of this, like, none of that was even a concept in society. It, did, it didn't exist. Nobody spoke about it. Nobody gave a fuck about it. It just didn't happen. So you try and, like, force it into his work and everything. And it's, like, it's like me trying to go, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to write a story about uh, Julius Gaius Caesar, but I'm going to put in an internal message in it about why Mac is better than PC. It doesn't belong there. It doesn't belong Dang. in the time period. Dang, I would watch that. Exist. If you I made it, watch. I'd watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to show these goals that Mac's better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these fucking android pagans. <laughs> Just uh, while, we're, while we're in the middle of... Uh, Talking about this here, I know that a couple of you guys have got to bow out now, sadly. Um, Robert and uh, and Mauler, I believe you're pretty much out of time here. Yes. Um, yes I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure having both of you gentlemen on tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Of course, it's always a pleasure. Drinker, Mauler, I, 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 I would love to give a shout out to both of you because if anyone is interested in the examination of stories and how stories are created and how stories work, both of your work on YouTube is essential viewing. And I would say that anybody who wants to understand how, how do you build a franchise? How do you build these kinds of stories? Your channels are essential and they, they certainly, I'm not being hyperbolous or hyperbolic, hyperbolism. Your, <laughs> your channels quench my soul. Can I say that? They do. You can. We will let you see. Thank you for the goddamn work you do because it is the Lord's work. And I cannot stand to see what's happening to classical storytelling. And Gary, you too, sir. Thank you for fighting the good fight because great storytelling is how we define ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have great storytelling, we will lose our understanding of who we are. Hey man, <laughs> thank you so much for the compliments, and it's been a, been a pleasure to meet you. Uh, thank you so much. And of course, thank you for the work, man, and thank all three of you. It's such an honor. And Count, I, I, I don't know much about you, but goddamn, you're a smart motherfucker. Can I say that? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, the, you're, that. The, you're, the, you're the first person to ever say that. But yeah. well, <laughs> I bid you all farewell. Thank you so much. It was a great honor to be here. Uh, sure. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Thanks man. Man. Uh, yeah, I'm heading off as well. Gary, I'll probably see you on a Tuesday, I imagine. Yeah. 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 I'm going to drag you back onto EFAP at some point. I'm going to make you play Gothic Phone. It'll be great. I, hey. uh, just, uh, just don't make me listen to that fucking song again <laughs> after I've said <laughs> Fuck me, man. <laughs> I'll find a different video for you next time. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah, uh, Drinker, always wonderful. I'll catch you next time, sir. Thanks, Morris. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you for coming on. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, chat. You guys have fun. Bye bye. Later. Bye bye. All right. Um, I'm just kind of thinking here because I do, I know there's quite a lot of super chats that have piled up while we've been doing this. I'm kind of wondering whether I should just do them all in a catch up stream, um, you know, rather than uh, keeping you guys on. I don't know how much time you've got. Um, a little bit more. I got to do a catch up one myself <laughs> yeah. later today. So, uh, uh, no, but I can, I can hang out for a little while longer. I'm cool. Yeah, I've I've got I've got my own stream to do at twelve, so I can hang around for like another like twenty something minutes. All right, well, I'll tell you what, then we'll see how many we can get through in that time, and yeah. uh, and then we'll, we'll pretty finish up at twelve. I suppose that's a pretty good time to to call it a night. I suppose. Uh, well, not for you, Dank, obviously, because you're just starting another fucking stream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, just give me one second while I bring them up here. Supers. All right, here we go. Uh, right, so the first one, 
uh, from fucking hell. There's a lot. Still scrolling, still scrolling. Uh, all right, Maka Jr. says, I defended you guys over Simu's post uh, saying it's false, which got me asked by a mate why I defend racists uh, until my Asian wife told him to watch the vids like she did because uh, he's wrong. He backtracked so fucking fast. Uh, aye, that was Simu Liu from uh, yeah. from uh, Shang-Chi, how, how that, how who's, who's that, apparently yeah. having a, a good old laugh because we predicted that his movie wasn't going to do well, and he, he thinks it's uh, he thinks it's doing great. It's, doing um, it, it's going to have to make four or five hundred million easily to mm -hmm. break even. It's not going to get anywhere no. fucking near that. So uh, yeah, you know, have a good laugh, Simu. Um, we'll see. We'll see what your film ends up with by the end of its fucking run, mate. Well, I mean, now we could just move goalposts and say it's the number. You know, yeah, it's the number one movie in in the world with absolutely no competition. And some people are staying away from movie theaters. They say it's like some variant they're talking about. But I've seen packed football stadiums. I was in Vegas last weekend. It was packed. There's traffic everywhere. I think it might be just the movie theaters people are staying away from. My, my I mean, wife. I got to be honest, mate. Like, I I went and saw it opening weekend, um, and over here in the UK, like, we're pretty much back to normal. There's not much worry about all that stuff. Um, the the cinema I was in was about twenty percent full. It was it was fucking deserted. Same here. And that was opening weekend for Shang Chi. So, pff, draw your own conclusions, like, right, Shang Chi. Um, uh, I would suck Brie Larson's toes. <laughs> Here says, uh, ahoy there, shipmates. Are we making this a regular thing? Because you can never have too much drinker as neurotic Mauler, Rob, and wank. Uh, well, you can never have too much wanking in life, I would say. Bro, it's good uh, for the yeah, yeah. It is, I. Um, I'm trying to do this every second week, so I'll do like a happy hour and do like a movie review one week and then do another open bar the next. So it seems to be working out all right so far, I would say. Um Mr. Cheese says, Drinker, my girlfriend and I just watched a forgotten Clint Eastwood classic, Kelly's Heroes. For the love of God, man, watch this movie. An, an American platoon goes AWOL to hunt for Nazi gold. Bravo, lack of concern. Sorry, bravado, lack of concern, and great times. Uh, I, Kelly's Heroes is a fantastic movie. I love it. Uh, it's got Donald Sutherland as well, and Telly Savalas. Yep. Uh, yeah, you just, yeah, it's just a fun, fun you movie be on heavy rotation uh out of la uh because i grew up 100 miles out outside of la so i'd get all the la stations back because i'm old but we got them th this thing called the air uh and we'd have tv antennas and we have like three channels to, and they uh, kelly's heroes was on once a month on channel five it was great nice um rrtnz says hail drinker whiskey fueled wordsmith and distinguished guests i have a have a pint on me, mate. Uh, by the way, as an author, any thoughts on comic writers, uh, fellow Scotsman, Mark Miller and Grant Morrison? Cheers. Um, so Grant, sorry, Mark Miller wrote Kick-Ass, as far yep. as I'm aware. And, and he's also a fellow Coat Bridge boy. Nice. <laughs> uh, what was the that? other one he done that's been turned into a movie? A Kingsman. Kingsman, yeah, Kingsman. <clears throat> uh, aye, good stuff. Yeah, well, I like Mark his Miller, stuff. He wrote Civil War uh he did a pretty good uh fantastic four run uh he wrote the ultimates uh he's 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 good uh some people don't like him uh, he gets a little um he, he was around when they were introducing a lot of uh nihilism into uh comic books but at the time it was fine it was fine for its time uh it's a little too much now but i i think the guy's great i like uh that whole millar world for netflix i thought it was gonna go somewhere and it uh they, they pulled the plug on this first series that was weird hmm. um from the same guy says for a second point apparently the first matrix film lifted a lot of the best ideas from morrison's invisibles comic check it out cheers boyos um it lifted a lot read that one. from a lot of things it was uh the matrix was, was paying homage to a lot of things um, and with that Unhinged says, I'll take a double of the drinker neat and I'll baby face on the rocks. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Uh, Clever Comment says, hey, a drinker, uh, what do you and Mauer think of the five or six character assassinations in the zombie episode of What If? Uh, that's one that I haven't seen, actually. I've seen the latest one with um, with Tony, 
where basically he instead of getting injured in Afghanistan, he gets rescued by Killmonger from um, from Black Panther. Um, and what can I say, man? If if Wakanda was a was a dude, then the MCU basically exists to suck his dick. Like that's that's all it is at this point. It's just like bigging up Wakanda and everyone associated with Black Panther as much as possible, and that's all that episode is. Um, Tony Stark's just a fucking useless asshole in this, and he gets killed like halfway through. Sorry, spoilers. Mm. Um, yeah, it just another Marvel character destroyed, I suppose. Um, Big Prick says, "What a lineup!" Thanks, drinker. Hope you all have fun. Uh, cheers, man. And uh, I'm pretty sure we did. Jack Sun says, "What well, open bar must have been great success for you to try it again immediately." Uh, by the way, how do you feel about Turf Nation review of you? <laughs> According to him, you're quite toxic. I did you a favor of telling him you're not quitting anytime soon. Uh, I, this is some asshole that apparently made a video about me uh, saying that I'm a toxic, reactionary, misogynist, phobe of everything. Fuck it, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, did you not get many of them? I get about three of them a day, man. <laughs> I don't you know. I'm just, I'm building up to it, you know. Um, so, uh, I, what, you don't like me destroying your culture? What are you, some kind of reactionary? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Cherry picking quotes out of context from me. Aye, it's, it's a great way to make videos, man. It's awesome. Um, the, the last time I checked, I think his ratio was like, you know, 500 upvotes to like, 5,000 down votes or something, so I uh, fuck it. Let him do his thing. Um, Far Outcast says, Pitter patter, let's get at her. Um, cruising for a reason to break open a bottle of scotch at the end of the day in the office. Wait, why the hell am I waiting? Cracks open bottle. Yeah, quite right, man. Fucking, why, uh, why hold back? Don't let your workplace dictate what you're going to drink. Uh, but yeah, thanks very much for the donation, man. I appreciate it. Uh, the boys in the lab says, Hi, Drinker and friends. I uh, like to make movie posters um, and wanted to ask all of you what you wanted your favorite, sorry, what your favorite movie posters are. Yeah, so like out of all the stuff that we've seen um, or all the posters that we've seen, what's been our favorite? Wow. I, I like I don't know. <laughs> I like I'm going to say the, ro the Rocketeer, the, the fucking Art Deco posters of the Rocketeer were just absolutely beautiful. I love that style. Yeah, I like the early 80s. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Empire Strikes Back, the first one, um, Excalibur, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nightmare uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, the first one. I, I like, you know, just the, that 80s style. That's my favorite. I, I genuinely like the the big trouble in little china poster yeah, that i've got like yeah. where, where the dude is like insanely muscular like way more than the actual actor and yeah there's just like every single thing in the movie is just crammed into the poster oh, yeah, yeah, i love it yeah they're like yeah, the <laughs> giant main character and then they have like all the the side characters like his midgets in the front you know and it's yeah like, it. <laughs> no, that's great stuff um wizards says well this seems like quite the lineup have at it boys Thanks, man. I think we did. Uh, Aaron T says, cheers. Cheers to you, mate. Um, Shark Dentures says, that's the spirit, old boy. Literally. Yeah. Uh, my spirit tonight is Woodford Reserve. It's a good good bourbon. Um, King Crow says, sure, now you wear sunglasses. Yeah, I didn't wear them for the, the fucking um, They Live stream. I just couldn't find them at the time, and I didn't think to wear them. So, yeah, I've, I've made good on that, man. Uh, but it was good to have you on that night. Chris Alpha gave me a super sticker. Thanks, mate. Um, Tom, <laughs> Tom Bombadillo says, Hello, drinker, and you all. You must forgive me. I've not but coffee for this special occasion. Well, I mean, it's good enough, man. Um, Erm Erm says, uh, Hi, Rob, as Muller and Critical. Hello to you, sir. Uh, Richard Curtis says, Hi, Publicans. Just wondered if the drinker could mention any details of his next book. Uh, I can indeed. Yeah, it's um, it's a, a thriller um, that centers around a terrorist organization that managed to get their hands on a weaponized virus that they're planning to release, um, and it's set over multiple different time periods. Um, so that's all I can tell you at the moment. But it's going to be published in about August next year, I think. So uh, it's going to be called um, Dark Harvest. 
So keep that in mind. I'll tell you more as it comes. Excellent. Um, the Craig Lawrence experience says, hail you smooth criminals. Hit some bars in Anaheim last night, so I'm feeling uh, quite post-inebriated. Uh, <laughs> it's, always, it's always shit having a hangover, mate. Um, Alex A says, thank you all for your countless hours of entertainment you provide. Loving the drink series, drinker. Looking forward to the new book when that drops. Cheers, man, and uh, I'll let you know more about it as it comes. Um, Stephen Lenuto, hail drinker. Saw your video with King Crow doing a talk with you and Az about the Crow is the dream graphic novel and film. Ah, well, I'll see what I can do one day, mate. I'll try and every so often, I'll try and bring a subscriber or whatever in, just, uh, you know, a bit of variation. Um, Citrus K Night Gaming says, have a good one, fellas. Been enjoying these uh, new freeform style of conversation streams. Cheers. Thanks, man. And uh, yeah, I don't know about you guys. I, I like it. I like just being able to talk about whatever is happening now, not being stuck on a movie or whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It works out. <coughs> Not for me because like i can't stay on a subject more than 10 minutes anyway in our stream it just kind of goes so yeah that's fun it's fun it's, uh, it's um, shoot the shit with your friends that's all I, i'm really bad for going on fucking tangents <laughs> like yeah. really fucking bad for it i thought uh, when I we did that. our uh, alien 3 stream it was it was pretty good like it was pretty on topic but like when you when you went on a tangent it was usually somehow related to the film or the the comics or whatever that were supporting the movie um Oh no! I thought I was I thought I was terrible for it because I'm like, oh yeah, no. a Alien Three. Oh yeah, forgot about that. That's what we're talking about. But I went, oh, this other alien thing, and I just kept fucking going off on a journey. That was great, you know. It's, it's rather than just going like on in the next scene, this thing happens. Like you know, it was great. Like we we kind of darted about all over the place. It was good fun. Um, what's the next one? Salad Cream Boy says, not only is Ellie gay, Sam Wilson Falcon is black, and Manuko. Sorry, Mando has a moustache and Picard is old. But what I want to know is, why is Gamora? That is the eternal question, man. And uh, I don't think we'll ever answer it. Um, Stephen yeah. Othen says, Hail Drinker, um, RMB, As, Moller, Gary, and Dankula uh, when they get here. And everyone in the chat, save a glass of vodka for me. Wait, better make it two. Why not three? I mean, you know, might as well settle in for the evening. Zach Canning says, how have any of you watched Guy Ritchie's Rock and Roller? It's the third film in his London crime series. What was your impressions on it? I liked it. I thought it was actually quite a good movie. Um, it was extremely like Guy Ritchie and stuff like that, but it had like its funny moments. And I've been like, I actually thought it was a pretty good fucking movie. I liked it. And I, I think it was I think they were sort of trying to make him look like uh, Pete Doherty. Not look and yeah. act like him, but the whole I'm like a sort of underground music artist, but you will most likely find me in a crack then with a needle in my arm. I <laughs> 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 think, like, yeah. I think compared to like some of Guy Ritchie's stuff, it didn't have the same like memorable characters. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that was the like, one thing. Yeah, I would say like Lockstock and like Snatch were quotable as fuck. They were extremely quotable movies, but Rock and Roller didn't have much of that. Um, 007 Angelo says hello gents another all star lineup can't tell if Drinker is a bartender or James Bond why not both um, have a shake and not stirred on me cheers mate and if I had a vodka martini handy I would toast you right now uh, Captain Spire says most people uh, exposure to Star Trek is Star Trek online or the horrid new shows there's no seek out new life there's no joy there's no human adventure it's just a race to the next relevant explosion uh, that's that's pretty much summing it up right there. Like, um, yeah, remember when it was just the the joy of like seeing what was out there, like being explorers and exploring strange new worlds. That was nice. I liked it when when Star Trek did that. Mm -hmm. Shame it hasn't done it in like fifteen years. Yeah, I mean it's not only dead; it's long dead. Yeah, long dead. Uh, Rob Aitken says, bringing on Robert Meyer Burnett to talk Star Trek. Now that's soldiering. <laughs> I, um, Jack Sun says, watched Highlander. It was awesome. Of course it fucking was. Uh, I already have a bias in favor of 90s and 80s films and watching a good one I've never watched before. It's refreshing in a time where movies suck and motivating uh, to write a story of my own. Well, that's good. Um, yeah, I've said before, I really like the, the whole concept behind Highlander. 
you know, this idea of like people that have, have lived for hundreds of years and so you've got a story spanning all these different centuries. I like it. I think the the movie touched on some really interesting stuff. You know, they were obviously a wee bit limited by budget, but you know, that's kind of what you're stuck with. Yeah, it was still uh, God a thousand times more interesting than we have now, and always a good concept that the God please don't reboot. They are doing it. They're doing one with Henry Cavill, I, I think. Henry Cavill, that's right. Oh. Uh, I mean, as much as I like Henry Cavill, I just don't yeah. want to see him as Connor McLeod. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, I'd like to see him as Superman. That'd be nice. Yeah, yeah that'd be nice, yeah. Shit, we haven't done it in 10 years. Uh, Captain Spire says, Robert, I finally got my Brad Nelson phaser and old uh, kit medical tricorder fixed and working. Been talking about the... Sorry, with the hobbyist about his Trek stories. Um... Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I think that means more for Rob than it does for us, unfortunately. But well done fixing your phaser. Uh, Derek Coon says, Me giving my money and not getting a drink seems like the opposite of an open bar, but I'm just happy this seems to be a regular thing now. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, yeah, and your, your donation is much appreciated. Um, Dos Gecko says, All star lineup here, make it regular Trek stream. Um, it, it would be too depressing if we were talking about Star Trek every time because I think it would be every stream would just be us like, yeah, still shit. Yep. And we're going to have a bunch of it. bunch of it's coming right around the corner. Ugh. Uh, yeah, someone pointed out, like, I'm just trying to find it here in chat because it's moving so quickly. Um, fuck it. No, nah, the, the comments disappeared, but they were saying that Sam Hewen, who's in the Outlander TV show, should be Connor McLeod. He could play it, I reckon, pretty well. I keep forgetting that he exists. Yeah. Yeah, he probably would. Uh, <laughs> I love how the tangerine fucking things come up again. Tangerine. A tangerine, the size of a tangerine. tangerine. Sometimes, some tangerines just want to watch the tangerine burn. Fucking tangerines, <laughs> honestly. Um Stricker A says, the best, I think the best way to describe Star Wars sequels where the prequels were interesting ideas ex executed poorly, the sequels are bad ideas executed well, or at least flashy. I mean, I'd argue that they're bad ideas executed badly. Like, the, apart from, like, good special effects, there's really nothing going on there that's, um, that's commendable. You know, when I think back to the, the sequel trilogy, I've got nothing that I can say, like, yeah, they did that well. Yeah. Uh, fooled me on a couple of trailers. That's about it. Yeah. Uh, Scooty says, let's be honest, it's all the women's fault. <laughs> uh, yeah, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Uh, J-Max says, Muller's Grand Moff Tarkin rewrite was spot on for TLG. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember that. I, he, uh, he, he kind of put Tarkin into TLG and gave him, like, dialogue for that scene. Um like right at the start of the movie, and it was so much fucking better. Uh, Reaver Man says, press F for Clive Sinclair passing away today. No! Uh, press F in chat to pay respects. Um, Dos Gecko says, the further we get from Roddenberry's death, the further his ideals they take us. RMB, is there a creative you trust with the franchise? Uh, Rob's not here, but I don't know. Gary, is there anyone you'd want to see take over Star Trek? Uh, I'd like to see uh, Robert take over star trek i think if robert took over star trek it would uh he would write the ship literally uh i can't think of many uh, even uh showrunners i respect right now have kind of gone nuts so yeah i'd say robert okay yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't be inclined to argue there like uh blaine savini says Thursday afternoon tights. Yeah, that's kind of what this is turning into. Uh, more Alex Jones. Ask him on just to talk about Bohemian Grove. I, my God, we never got around to that. And uh, that was fun. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking to him again. Uh, I don't know when, but we will be talking to him again. Uh, oh, Alex Jones is a, is a treat. I love him. Um, he's, he's brilliant to hang about. Is he off camera? He's the exact fucking same, just not as loud. Just, yeah. talk, just <laughs> talks about the exact same shit. 
but not as loud. I don't know. I think I told you about this drinker, like when we were driving in his like tank truck thing that he owns. We were just no, driving. No, you told me about this one. No. I swear to God, right? Me and Sargon were in his like big bulletproof fucking truck thing that he's in, right? And we're driving and we're just looking at like we're just looking at the scenery like of Texas and it's been silent for about 10 minutes like nobody said a word and Alex just goes we're gonna beat the fucking globalists <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and we're just sitting there and we're like okay like and it was that meme where it's like literally no one Alex Jones like we're gonna beat the fucking globalists <laughs> oh, man. He's, he's funny as fuck man he's a funny guy yeah. I just love the idea of him just cruising around in his tank like that's how he gets from place to place. As, uh, it, it is the thing is literally bulletproof. Like you walk up to it and it's just like fucking hell. This thing I, you could use this in a war. Like it's mental. Yeah, yeah. No, he's, he's a hell of a character, is Alex. Like man, hi. It'd be interesting oh. to talk to him. Like it was, yeah. uh, it was a blast. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, no, no blowback at all for it. It was fine. Everything's been fine. Uh, get, oh yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. a few people oh, crying no, about it. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen a few people were like whinging about it, like some of the shit that he was saying. But it's like it's fucking Alex Jones, right? I mean, it's like see, see if anybody doesn't like Alex Jones, then don't watch anything with Alex Jones in it. Like going, oh, can't believe I'm watching this thing with this guy I hate, and now I'm angry. How could this be happening to me? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. <laughs> I watched the whole thing. Uh, yeah. yeah well uh it, it, it didn't work out for uh yeah just uh a couple false flag attempts later I'm still here yeah no, I, I, I know uh, everybody comes to friday night tights for hard-hitting news and information yeah well i, I think they, they definitely go to friday night tights for like nice safe comfortable politically correct discourse yes you know that's not gonna that's not gonna offend anyone you know it's like what do they expect man like and you bring on a guest like that it's like yeah you're, you're gonna you're gonna be taking a bit of a chance there and you're gonna be like, provoking a few people um why would they why would they then act all offended by it like just don't fucking watch it man yeah, because they're not really that offended. I mean, I know you guys know that, but uh, yeah, maybe they don't. Uh, they 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 have problems with other things other than me or even Alex. Uh, that's just a theory, though. Yeah, uh, but man, I, I tell you what, your your views were insane. You were getting like fourteen, fifteen thousand people watching you live. That's incredible, man. Yeah, it's like it almost almost triple our normal audience. So that was. Thanks, Alex. Uh, it was it was cool. <laughs> it was cool as hell. Yeah, and uh, and uh, it, not having time to prepare for it helped a lot too. But uh, it, I mean, most every the, most of the feedback has been positive. You, like so many people you, called and they were happy. You can't prepare for Alex. No. You, you just just don't just don't bother because I did a full interview with him, like a full interview, and on the floor in front of me, I had questions like lined out. I think I got about two questions in and see how we were talking earlier about tangents, right? <laughs> I wanted I wanted to ask him about freedom of speech and big tech censorship and all this shit. And then I, I shit you not, like word for word, he said in the interview, and then you're in this other dimension. And before you know it, you got a 300 foot praying mantis trying to break your will, <laughs> right? And I just, at that point, I just kicked the questions away and went, fuck it, fuck it. I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm not getting any of these. I'm just going to let the man fucking talk. <laughs> yep. I, I, I think he's one of those guys. You could probably just sit there in silence for the whole interview and just let him roll. Like he'd do it himself, basically. He would conduct his own interview. It, it does it like even even in fucking we went out for dinner. We went to like this like Texas steakhouse and everything. And I'm sitting there just like eating my steak, eating my macaroni and cheese, and he just goes, I was thinking about George Soros and uh and I'm like, What the fuck, man? Like <laughs> I'm off the plane like 20 minutes. <laughs> like, fucking hell. Do, do you ever have moments like that where you just have a total reality check? It's like, I, I was in Scotland, like, you know, just sitting in my house watching TV like a few weeks ago, and now I'm here in the States talking to Alex Jones. You know, it, like, it's all, it must always be a bit surreal at times. It, 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 the, the, the biggest moment for me, the, the biggest moment where that fucking happened was when 
I was over in the EU Parliament debating the EU Parliament on Article 13, and UKIP had signed me up to run as an MEP in the election. And I, I was, I remember, I was sitting in a bar in Strasbourg, and I remember thinking, just hold on, how? Why am I here? How did I get here? How the fuck did this happen? Like, I made a fucking stupid meme. Why the fuck am I in the EU Parliament? <laughs> like, how the fuck, man? Like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Weird. It's it's, it's it's a crazy ride that you go on with YouTube, man. Honestly, mm -hmm. <laughs> man, I fucking love it though. It's fucking great. Yeah, it yeah, it's, it it's something else. It's it's not like any other job, that's for sure. Um, oh hell no! I, I'm just I'm just conscious, gentlemen. Like I know, thank you. You were having to finish about midnight, so uh, we're. Oh, we're he's he's late. not got back to me, so he's probably going to be late. Right. Oh no! Oh no! Wait, nope. He replied to me five minutes ago. Oops. Uh, like, ah, okay. <laughs> right, I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce off. But uh, thanks very much for having me again, man. It's been a pleasure. No, always awesome to have you on, mate. So appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you. Nice one, man. I'll catch you after. Right. See you later. Right. Cheers, man. I, I think probably what we'll do actually is um, I'll maybe finish up there. I'm kind of conscious that we've been going for about three hours and. There's no way I'm going to get through all the super chats tonight, anyway. So, um, what I'll probably do is just I'll do a catch up stream then to to catch all the ones that I've I've not done already tonight. Um, I and just finish there. And Gary, you're the the last man standing, mate. I just want to say thanks to you for coming on tonight, man. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I can't say no one says no to the drinker. So and, <laughs> plenty of tried. Uh, yeah, they've well they tried, but. Uh, hey, uh, I had I had fun hanging out with you guys. I love doing this, and yeah, it's the, there's nowhere near a job. Uh, I, I know we, I call it it too, but it's like this is uh, the best fucking gig I've ever had, and it's totally surreal. Uh, and I uh, hope it continues as long as it, it can. But if it ends today, I am grateful, and I'm grateful I got to stream with you. And uh, that was that was a that was a murderous row today. That was a good job, man. Thanks for having me yeah. on. No, it was, it was awesome, mate. And uh, thank you to everyone. Like, all you guys in chat, you've been awesome. Uh, thanks to Lady Gravemaster for, for doing the modding on this. She's done an absolutely fantastic job. I really appreciate her stepping up for this. Uh, and, yeah, thank you for all the awesome super chats. Like I say, the ones that I haven't quite managed to get to tonight, I will do a catch-up stream in the next couple of days. Uh, so they'll all be taken care of. And, yeah, thank you to all of you. And I'm glad... Well, I hope you've enjoyed this this open bar. It's been great fun for me. And uh, yeah, for, for me and from Gary, that's all we've got for today. So we're going to go away now.